this <laughs> keeps coming up every time you come on, Brianna. Mm -hmm. I feel like you are accusing us of downplaying sexism. I think the fact that we've discussed this for like so much of the show tonight really indicates how sensitive y'all are about this. You cannot accuse us of things and not expect us to respond. Hey now, it's your boy PSA Sitch here with another Tuesday stream with everyone's favorite, the artist who's just enough. Adam <laughs> What's up, everybody? And look, we've got two special guests here. We've got Brianna Wu, who wants to call Demon Mama a pedo. No. And we have, um, <laughs> no. I'm really, I'm really important, <laughs> who wants to call Hassan Anabi, uh, a Hamas Anabi, a terrorist sympathizer. So this should be an interesting show. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Just excited to be here. Starting off with the most awkward intro imaginable that was the best intro imaginable. that's, Why that's really good stuff about. i appreciate that i appreciate that look that but, was me okay don't blame brianna for that obviously what, what is, okay, i'm wait, an what is, i'm a i'm a pot stirrer a uh an instigator here so brianna's innocent what's what's the drama what is this drama on demon mama i haven't been following any of this stuff so look, uh, my good friend, Jenny, uh, put out a video examining some of demon mama's, uh, past statements and some of the statements that, uh, her partners have made. Um, I'll let people watch it. They can make up their own, uh, uh, mind on it. Uh, I was tremendously disturbed by it. Um, so yeah, there it is. Jen, what's the Jenny? What? Uh, heterodox takes on Twitter. She's oh. amazing. Okay. I don't... She's a really good person. I like her a lot. Wow. Well, look at you being so diplomatic. Okay. So what's what an is... accusation? So, like, mean, real stuff with Demon Mama, this is someone who she's been extraordinarily cruel to me, but mm -hmm. I also know that she has trauma from, you know, internet communities going after her. And I'm going to be the bigger person and not add to that. So there <laughs> wait, wait, I have trauma too. I, does that mean I get a get out of jail free card? <laughs> Look, I want to be yeah. a dick to people. Yeah. Uh, you just let me know. I'll let you have any drama you want. Just uh, give me the token. Just DM it to me and we'll move on. Look, DGG okay. keeps calling me a right winger. What do I get for that? <laughs> what, what, what kind of look, who, what can I do? Who can I be mean to? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so this look I, i'm gonna let i'm gonna let it go I, I obviously that's not a big deal so okay. um yeah uh so it, the video is, you said it was disturbing what is yeah like there's a car accident or uh, there are some comments about you know i, I uh, <laughs> there there are some comments about an acceptability level for uh anime depictions of sexualized children right and Ooh, ouch people Ow. being into this stuff and Boy. uh i i would just say if uh i had a partner that looked at that stuff i would leave them that day so okay yeah mm -hmm. i agree it is. yes yeah okay. i would call yeah. wood chippers are us but myself <laughs> the the thing is a lot of people they want to debate this topic and they say, look, no one is harmed in here because it's just, it's a drawing. But what they don't realize is that possessing CP is illegal. Yeah. So it, do it doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter if it's AI generated. It doesn't matter if it's a That's cartoon. That's not true, though. That's just inaccurate. You can possess and draw child pornography if it's a cartoon. Really? Yes. Are Why you, would you are it, you though? are you certain oh, about that's that? That's a whole other question. <laughs> are you are you like, certain about that? It is it is illegal America, to yeah. Yeah. it is illegal to possess child so child porn. I understand. Well, I, listen, I've never done a deep dive in the legality of this because it's not a subject. Okay, so you don't even know. Me. But no, this is what I've heard from other people, like in the Destiny, you know, <laughs> conversations about legal CP and stuff, is that um, the so like if you take a picture of a child, obviously it's illegal. And it should be, and you're harm because you're you know you're harming an individual. That's like the thought process behind the law. 
But if it's a cartoon, I don't believe like you're not harming an individual. You don't believe. It, right? So let's do a deep dive into this before. Well, you if actually... you want to listen, if you want to Google search look, it, if you... look it up to have that on your thing. You can I love do how it. I'm really important is smart enough to just shut the fuck I'm up. I'm just right saying, now. my understanding is that that's legal. So it's just, yeah, I mean, no, it's, man. Gross, it's all but, weird. You know? Yeah, it's all weird. It's you, all oh, weird. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. Well, it should be illegal. Okay. And, well, and it, it should, should the, the it should be capital punishment for people who possess this stuff. <laughs> I I think there should be should no not... no trial. The police should just execute them on site. I think right. if you're in the business of being in politics and advocating for a political system, mm -hmm. I think it's probably not smart to advocate for um, this kind oh, you of sexualized think? imagery <laughs> you think? of children while you're doing it i think that is i think that's bad i would not do that especially if your shtick is uh moralizing and explaining to people how they failed your morality test um i don't think you should talk about this publicly mm. yeah there you go that's my position well sitch will be doing that deep dive and then reporting <laughs> back to no, us no 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 <laughs> someone else can do it. listen people in the chat said i was right okay that's all I need. That's all the confirmation I need. Those Let people feel free to ban them mods. All of them. <laughs> no, no. So, uh, okay, so anyway. I, I guess I guess we're moving on to Il uh, Israel Palestine. You yes. want to you want to begin, Mister Important, with I guess you had got I saw a dust up where it seemed like Hassan's Hamas Pikers fans were attacking <laughs> you on on Twitter. Yeah, I, I just so saw... So give us the backstory. Okay, I, I just saw Hassan trying to explain from the river to the sea is actually an aspirational Oof. thing, and he compared it mm -hmm. to um, people saying Black Lives Matter, or some nonsense, and I just said, I just wrote, what a fucking moron. Literally four <laughs> words. Just four tweeted in, wrote, what a fucking moron. No other input, nothing. And he decided, that got to the top of Destiny subreddit, and so, I, of course, Hassan stalks the subreddit. And so he had to respond. It's kind of like a proxy war between him and Destiny. So he quote tweeted me and wrote a whole uh, book report about uh, <laughs> oh, these boy. liberals. And, oh, you know, here's what it means. And at the end, he says, like, he kind of excuse it doesn't excuse October 7th or whatever. But he just says, like, it was because of the mistreatment of the Palestinians, like explaining it. And so. Why he chose to respond to me, I don't know, but it just raised my profile to get quote tweeted by him because he has uh, like a million and a half followers and it put me in that arena. He did this to me and it was not a good afternoon, I will just say. Mm -hmm. So you got caught you got caught up in that as well, Brianna? Yeah. I not related to uh what happened to I'm really important, but just separately he tried to uh, basically shoehorn me and get me to uh, uh, say that Israel was an apartheid state, right? Which, um, you know, I mean, look, my public position is out there. I've been very, very clear on this. Uh, yeah, I do not support Netanyahu. Uh, I think anyone that looks into, uh, you know, his leadership can see uh, he's a pretty corrupt guy. I think he's fairly analogous to Bush too, in the fact that he's used terrorism to keep himself in power very cynically. I think if you're noticing stories about him delivering you know, suitcases of cash to Hamas, I think for any reasonable person, this raises questions of him perhaps enabling Hamas for, or for a deliberate opposition. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't support Netanyahu, but I do also really not support anti-Semitism. And let's be really clear, the left in discussing this has lapsed again and again and again and again into the most uh, anti-Semitic tropes that dehumanize, you know, not Netanyahu, not Israeli foreign policy, which I don't support, but, uh, you know, American Jews that don't have anything to do with this. And, uh, you know, I've called that out. And I got to tell you, my social media has been a war for weeks now. And it's really, really discouraging. <laughs> yeah, wow. I saw you even went protected for a while. And I was wondering what was going on. But I just I want to give yeah. a fair warning, because there is going to be a bit of I told you so in this live stream. <laughs> today. Fair, Ooh. fair, so. fair. Yeah, so um, just to expect that. Look, I I brought you both on because a lot of times our our live streams end up becoming like a two v one, and I figured, look, there's two of you, there's two of us, 
So we can dole out the I told you so's and you guys can can react. Okay. But um, I, 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 is there going to be a fight? Because every <laughs> statement I have is going to be like, yeah. I mean, I don't know what there is well, to say. I, yeah. I see where Adam's going. He's going to be like, you know, this stuff's been present. You guys just haven't seen it. That kind of thing. Is that yeah. what's going on? Maybe yeah. it's going to be a 3v1 against like, IRI. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we'll see. I mean, listen, this is the first time I find myself criticizing some, not only people on the left. I'm, I'm shocked by the anti-Semitism. They're couching it hiding behind anti-Zionism. And that's what got me yeah. to step into this. I stayed out of this for a couple of weeks because I'm like, no one's going to like my takes. My family is from kibbutzes, right mm -hmm. near the ones that were attacked. I, My opinion is very biased. It's not going to go over well. So I just kind of keep it to myself. But once I start seeing Hassan and others attacking Zionism, that pissed me off because that just, you might as well say Jewish people because what are you hiding behind Zionism? They don't know what any yeah. of that shit means. Okay, when so someone says Zionism, you know mm -hmm. you're in for a really shitty conversation. <laughs> like right. you know it's gonna get kind of racist really quickly. Well, so let's start there. Um, you know, because I hear this very often. It's not people, you know, Hassan and other people who say they're not anti-Semitic, they're anti-Zionist. So why do you think that that's really anti-Semitic? Well, I think they they don't they don't have an understanding of what Zionism is. And not that I'm an expert, but mm -hmm. for me, Zionism is just the Jewish people having a state. It's not the exclusion of other people. It doesn't mean the destruction of other people. Are there extremist elements within Zionism? Of course. Are there people who have hijacked it and done crazy things with it? Sure. But for me, Zionism has always been when people attack Zionism, it's always a way to attack Jewish people. So that that's where I start. Mm -hmm. You have a take, Brandon? No, I, I agree with that. And it's not to say you can't have a nuanced discussion on or a more academic discussion on should Israel, like what is the best solution for policy here? Uh, you know, I was, I want to admit, I found this to be very laughable, but there is an ongoing discussion about like a one state solution where I suppose Israelis, like Joe Biden calls up Netanyahu and says, uh, Bibi, uh, time to dissolve them to wrap the whole thing up. And he goes and dismantles all the borders mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Palestinians just come in and all the uh, Jewish people that live in Israel that uh, have members memories of the Holocaust and moved to Israel uh, to uh, all the hopes of having a safe state of their own, they just go, oh, all right, that's fine. We'll deal with this. And then uh, everybody lives side by side and it's utopia. Um, you know, that's a discussion that seems to be going on. And I guess you can have that discussion. But like, don't tell me with a lot of this, there's not this undercurrent when the, when they say, you know, Zionists, they really want to say the Jews, or at least mm -hmm. it's the impression I get. I mean, tell me if I'm crazy. Well, I know it's weird. Like, I think there's a lot of people, especially like in the Middle East, and when you see a lot of these protests, and when you see a lot of people, unfortunately, in the Middle Eastern descent, like in you know Australia, saying gas the Jews. I mean, obviously, that's <laughs> very <laughs> anti-Semitic uh, thought process there. And so I, I definitely think from a global perspective, anti-Semitism definitely has a huge role in people not liking Israel. Yeah. Um, but I think from a lot of the leftist American perspective and even the leftist Canadian perspective, I don't know if it's so much anti-Semitism, if it's just this kind of lens, the, what I would call brain rot lens of looking at the world through the oppressed oppressor lens and saying yeah. like, you know, they think, oh, you know, in their mind, Israelis are white Europeans, which is not true, but that's how they perceive it. You know, Israelis are white Europeans who came to a region of non-white people and colonized them. And I think that's how they view it. And that's why they have such a dumb take on it. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. Um, I do just just for balance want to say, you know, my good friend Dean Obadala, who is a former Siren Live writer, he has a show over on Sirius XM. Really great guy. And yeah, you know, he's Palestinian. He has family mm. that grew up there. And yeah, you know, I was on his show last night and he's talking with a lot of um pain, frankly, about what it was like to grow up in the West Bank and have, you know, Israeli policy being like cut more into the border, cut more into the border to deliberately settle there, uh, you know, displace people. He actually had uh, his grandmother that lost uh lost her home uh from this. And you know, just seeing this really hostile Israeli foreign policy year after year. And he's 
Again, Dean is not anti-Semitic. He he has condemned that regularly on the show uh, for years, uh, you know, but there's a lot of pain on his side over, you know, seeing Palestinian children without water and electricity. And he's coming at this in good faith. And I do think that is a foreign policy that is eminently fair to criticize where I really have to say this is not appropriate is when people on my own side are are really just um frankly being anti-semitic to uh you know people like IRI right uh mm -hmm. and just um like there's no future for addressing this crisis that doesn't involve people like IRI you know like like working with uh, the mainstream democrats and kind of changing uh course on the foreign policy of our country we have to be partners with everyone and i just think there's this tendency to dismiss them that it, it's not just it's just not anti-productive it's it's anti-semitic i think have, have people been saying uh explicitly directly anti-semitic things to you ira i mean not not uh the normal stuff but call me a nazi saying my family or genociders and mm -hmm. things like that but i mean right. i nice. i can just feel it you know i've dealt with anti-semitism my whole life and and i can just feel when people are mm -hmm. what they not saying what they really want to say and, and yeah. just being mm -hmm. nasty but mm -hmm. um you know what i'm not what the anti-semitism for me is what i'm not hearing and that is that the Jewish people have a right to live here side by side in peace with everybody. It's it's the dismantling of Israel, a nation that's been there 75 years. And it's just this pipe dream that these people are selling to their fan base. Uh, and it's it's also a distance from the Holocaust that a lot of these young people have that they don't um, they don't understand why Israel was founded in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I agree that it's like this pipe dream. Because I mean, we watched a bunch of Hassan content on this, and to me, it is an uh, absurd pipe dream that there'd be a one state that's like a secular state. Because I don't, my understanding is that no one, either side, really wants that. So it's kind of silly to advocate for such something that no one wants. But I'm curious, IRI, if theoretically, like there was, you know, the majority of Palestinians were in favor of living in a secular Western liberal democracy, um, and with Israel, and Israel is like one state. Would you be in favor of that solution? I don't think so, because for me, Israel is a place for Jewish people to be safe. I mean, Jewish people are treated like shit all over the world, mm -hmm. even to this day. And there's got to be one place where Jewish people don't have to watch their back and can just be themselves. And so I, I just don't think it works. That's why I support a two state solution or even a three state solution, whatever it takes. Not tomorrow. I don't think I think Israel could end there their blockade they could bring down the wall in gaza they could give people the right to return whatever all that and they would still be slaughtered by hamas so it, it's not about the palestinian cause when it comes to like hamas so for security reasons it's just not feasible to have a one-state solution mm -hmm. even if it's a secular state it makes no sense well i mean like actually what you're saying like it, it like this is all theoretical obviously because mm -hmm. like if, if they integrated now there'd be this massive cons uh like safety concern but if like in some hypothetical scenario, you know, the Palestinian population overall, you know, was in favor of a secular Western democracy, you know, I think that it could work. And I think Jews could be safe in Israel without it being explicitly a Jewish state. Um, but I understand that that's this is all like highly hypothetical. I don't know, man. Jews get shit on wherever they go. So I, I'm not very confident that like democratizing and like being uh -huh. secular is going to help them you know just just to bring it back to the lens so part of i think our position is that this oppressor oppressed dynamic is the lens of wokeness something yes. that we've we've okay. talked about and you guys have have probably talked about but, but been in favor of so i i'm curious mr important if if you do you think these people are calling you a Nazi because you're Jewish? Or do you think they're calling you a Nazi because you're a, a colonizer, an oppressor? <laughs> uh, well, I probably more the oppressor. They think that I support the genocide of the Palestinians, which I disagree with the premise in the first place. I don't think they're being genocided, but that's their view that I'm no better than Hitler and the Nazis trying to remove the Jews from the face of the earth. And so, you know, it's 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 the nastiest of of insults they can call a Jewish person a Nazi. Yeah, but has, like, has this changed your opinion on like leftism or wokeism or socialism at all? I haven't thought about it like in that 
in that regard. Like, oh, well, you got to. Well, look, the well, lens no. has been turned on you now. That's why we're asking. Sure. <laughs> no, but but listen, here's the thing. These people have always hated me because I'm a liberal. I know you guys disagree with me taking that label, but what, what do you mean? We're liberals. Have, I know, but you say I'm not. You say I'm a progressive. Right. Okay. So, well, look, you, it sounds you, like you you're had... taking steps towards being a liberal here. So I like that. <laughs> well, I've always been, this has always been my position. So these people have always hated me. I was just nice. So they couldn't do it openly. Now they have a reason to hate me openly. Yeah, because you're support. a colonizer. You're a... Well, and you're I, here's what I think. I think a lot of these people are misguided. I think it comes down to distance from the Holocaust. A lot of these young people don't know about the Holocaust. They don't know why the Jewish people have Israel. And I do think there is this sort of black and white oppressor versus oppressee. I think TikTok plays a major role in this. People are not getting their news from watching TV or even lengthy YouTube videos. They are going on TikTok. And TikTok, what is China's goal with TikTok? It's in order to sow discord in the Western world. So I think a lot of these people are just being manipulated. And I don't know what the hell is going on in these college campuses. But, you know, I think it's a minority of, of the voices. I don't think it's a majority. So I, I agree with that. I think you have two generations of Americans now that have no memory of any institution in this country functioning. Um, yeah, you know, I'm just old enough to remember, uh, you know, like the first Gulf War, right? It happened when I was very, very young, but I, I'm old enough to remember like Democrats and Republicans coming together. I'm, I'm old enough to remember uh, foreign policy operations were genuinely done in the national interest. I'm old enough to remember when, uh, you know, when our left versus right politics ended at the United States border. I think what we have two generations of Americans now that believe is they've never thought really seriously about, uh, you know, uh, geostability. I think they take national security for granted. And I think they have this really erroneous paradigm in their mind that America is always the bad guy. Now, I want to be really clear. I protested George Bush II every single weekend for years for a reason. I didn't do that for fun. I did because I thought uh, he was the worst president we'd ever had. And I thought he was uh, getting my friends killed in Iraq. But there was no point where, like, at the same time, I could point to you to a hundred things the United States has, has done that's been tremendously good for the world, right? It's not just U.S. bad, like Hassan said today. There's a much more complicated calculus about how these things work. And I think uh, you know, Democrats have not done a very good job of telling that, um, helping educate uh, younger people about this. And I think Republicans have also not done the same thing. So I don't think it should be surprising that we have uh, two generations of America with a very simplistic analysis of how to evaluate our actions in the world. Um, but I, th I think we, I think this is a wake up call that we need to have far more sophisticated discussions. Well, this well, is the purpose of ideology though. Ideology is designed to simplify the world, to create a stylized world where everybody is a oppressor or oppressed so that people who are not very bright know how to behave in the world. They know who to hate and who to love. So, but this is, this is my problem with ideology. And this is one of the critiques that we've had of this ideology for a long time. So I think it's been mischaracterized as like hating progressives or hating progressivism. I look, I would call myself progressive in a, in a different time when there wasn't this simplistic ideology that was turning people into monsters. Well, I think what, yeah, and I think what Adam's getting at is that, you know, we think or we feel, and I obviously I think this is very true, that this, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, leftism, socialism, wokeism, this ideology of the oppressor versus the oppressed, this ideology of like, you know, you know, we need to deconstruct whiteness and all this, you know, other stuff. Like this ideology is toxic and it's the ideology that led people down the pathway to have these takes on Israel and, and to say the things that they're saying about this. And I don't think it's just like, because it sounds kind of like IRI that you're saying that this is like a one-off thing, but I don't think it is. I think this is obviously where the ideology goes. And I think that the left broadly in America and in Canada needs to kind of push back against this and kind of expel these radical elements from the left. Yeah, no, I, I see where you guys are coming from. I, I do think we've gotten into a world where things are binary and it's you're on one side or the other. And that does lead to the where we're at right now. 
unfortunately. But I didn't see that in the past when it came to issues. I saw nuance within BLM or the COVID era, whatever. And I'm sure you guys disagree, but I saw nuance within the left on that. And um, on this issue, it just it seems like, again, what got me into it? Maybe it's personal and, you know, maybe I'm waking up or something, but it doesn't change my opinion on the left or Biden or uh, Democrats or woke culture or whatever. It doesn't change my opinion on any of that other stuff. It's just this one thing I feel is people falling victim to anti-Semitism without realizing. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism out there coming from the right. No offense to the righties out there, but you have to admit it's mostly been coming from those types. And I think that that bleeds over a lot to people and they don't even realize it. And and they they take on a lot of this. It's kind of like in 2016 with the attacks on Hillary by the right that bled over to the left and, and affected a lot. Some of the Bernie people, too. So that's that's kind of what I'm seeing, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. well, you go, Brian. No, I was going to I agree with IRI uh, or should I call you uh, Mr. Important? Either one. Uh, <laughs> no, but I've got an equally hard question for you. I mean, I hear mm-hmm. you. I hear what you're saying about ideology, like breaking things down to a simplistic point of view. And I, I agree with you. But when I see this situation exactly like Mr. Important does, I see a confluence of a lot of different events. I see uh, generations of Americans that are getting uh, points of view that let's be frank, uh, have been underrepresented in media for most of my lifetime, like the plight of the Palestinians. I think we would all agree that CNN and you know the New York Times, they tend to not really cover these things accurately. But y'all's reaction to this is, aha, more evidence that wokeism is bad, which to me seems like kind of an equally simplistic analysis. I want to be really clear. I've been fighting with these people on Twitter for weeks now. I am far more black pilled on areas of my movement than I was two weeks ago. And uh, like Adam, you've told me repeatedly that these are some dangerous people that need to be called out. And I agree with your assessment there. But I think you're concluding that the entire movement is broken or corrupt. And I think that's a it's just too far in my assessment. Well, First of all, I just want to say that we're trying to differentiate. I mean, I know a lot of people don't do this. Sure. But me, but me and Adam try to differentiate between, you know, uh, mainstream Democrats and liberals and like socialist leftists. Like these are different groups of people, even though I think very often the mainstream left, unfortunately, you know, gets in bed with them for some reason. Like, so I'm not trying to say like every, like the entire left in America is broken. And I don't think that's what Adam's trying to say. Um, but where I think it's important to understand is that this is not a one-off. And I and I understand that, like, I understand how you could see it that way. Either of you could see it that way, because it's like once the lens gets turned on you for the first time, it's like, wait, what the hell's going on here? Or maybe it's easier to not see it when it's not on you. Because, like, one of the comparisons I made, and obviously these are very extremely different in terms of levels of severity, but, you know, the same thought process, the same moral intuitions that kind of went behind a lot of these same people's take on the BLM stuff, like, you know, what you brought up earlier, IRI, is what's manifesting here in the Israel Hamas situation. Because we saw the same people making excuses for shoplifting. We saw the same people making excuses for rioting and looting, saying, you know, there are poor people, there are poor black people that are being oppressed by a system. And therefore, it's okay for them to go and, you know, destroy private property, you know, and do all these things that are against the law. And that's essentially the same argument they're making here. They're saying, well, the Palestinians are poor and they're being oppressed by Israel. So therefore, you know, they're justified in fighting back. It's the same thought process, just to a more severe degree. Oof. I, I, I see where you're coming from. Don't get me wrong, but I, I just think that you know, listen, I was making fun of those people, too, at the same time for those takes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I never never was like, yeah, shoplifting's based like that's <laughs> idiotic, you know, Well, like, not just shoplifting, but also just this like, let's downplay. Let's not denounce people who are like looting and rioting and doing these things. Mm-hmm. Right. There was a lot of like riots, riots are the, the language. Heard, you yeah, know, there like... you go. So the language I wanna, of the oppressed. I... 
I, I want this as an admission, and I, I think this is a fair criticism of me. I will completely cop to, I never said any of that garbage, like, oh, it's great to go out and shoplift, or this doesn't matter. But when um, you know some of the BLM riots happened, I completely admit, I looked at that news, I saw it on my news feed, and I said, I'm just not going to get involved with this. I knew it was wrong. Uh, but I did not speak out about that, right? And I think every single time on the left, we choose to kind of look the other way when it makes a point for us. I think it's corrupting our culture and our political movement. I, I do worry that we're becoming less capable of intellectual honesty and looking at our own side and holding our own side to the standards we expect of other people. I really struggle with this because we're here talking about this today. And, you know, there's a story that just came out in Axios about, you know, Donald Trump going through and basically uh, pre-approving people uh, that would serve in his cabinet uh, and basically enact revenge on political opponents, right? So the, the stakes on the other side, in my view, is literally democracy or fascism. So I think it's it's hard because sometimes I want to focus on the truly terrifying existential threat to our country that I see. But I also see like this, this culture on my own side of not speaking up when things are wrong. And, you know, mm -hmm. I or I would probably both agree. Like my mentions have been a war zone for calling out the anti-Semitism on the left for weeks now. It's not pleasant to go through. I wish I did not have this kind of backlash, but I do think it's important that some part of what we advocate for is a, a leftism that's fundamentally honest. You you bring well, up I, an interesting point because the I, I did see that article about the right. The, the the problem I see is there's two ideologies in conflict here. These there's the oppressor oppressed ideology, and there's the liberalism individualism ideology. You know, one is collectivism, uh, collectivist by nature, and the other is individualist. And and the right, exactly as you're saying, I mean, what allows them to to say it's no big deal that Trump is doing this thing, which I, I admit is terrifying to me as well, is using the oppressor oppressed lens. They're saying, listen, we're being oppressed by liberals now. We're being oppressed by the left. And therefore, we have to take power by any means necessary because we are the victims. We are in the victim role. And I mean, you you know, I'm sure both of you know, this is a lot of the Nazi um, arguments in favor of the Holocaust as disgusting as it was, was they were being victimized by the wealthy Jews. So it just it, this, the danger of this ideology is, is something that I think it's easier if we focus on the fact that it is this ideology and that there are these two things in conflict. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Important. Well, I, I want to say I feel bad that Brianna's having um, such blowback. I've just been laughing at all of it. Maybe I'm a psychopath, but I just mute <laughs> tweets and I just ignore if I get annoyed. But nothing these people have said have hurt me at all. I, I just, uh, it all water off a duck's back. I don't know. I, I just, you know, I think I've heard it all at this point. So um, it doesn't bother me to fight with them. And I don't really engage because that's what they want. They want some attention. And so they're all, most of them are sick people. I, I guess, Adam, the first thing that came to mind for me with, I agree with the oppressor oppressed thing. And I do think that people are seeing stuff in, in black and white terms. And, and that is problematic. And perhaps this is the first time I've seen it, that it impacts me with anti-Semitism and makes my community less safe. So it, it bothers me. But I think when it comes to the right, they're trying to take away rights and justify that by saying that they're being oppressed. And it, it feels manufactured. It doesn't feel authentic. Whereas on the left, I've always felt that, OK, some people are soy and they're pushing things too far, but their heart's in the right place. And they are sticking yeah. up for people that are genuinely in need of a voice. For example, the people, let's say the people that are stealing. Those are people who don't have a voice. I mean, there, there's a lot of people out there that are suffering economically and they don't have Wait, a voice. Look, you just a second ago said you weren't going to make excuses for shoplifting and you've reversed your position well, not, on that pretty quickly here. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying I don't think the argument that people are making is correct. I don't think supporting people shoplifting is correct. And I'll laugh in their face at that in a second. 
But when I hear people complaining, like, oh, look at all these locks I have to go through. I have to go get the cashier to open it up for me and stuff. I'm like, come on, man. Like, you're missing the whole problem. Why are people stealing in the first place? Let's have that conversation. Let's not talk about, oh, I'm inconvenienced because I have to go get They're, the, they're stealing the... because they can have excuses. They can they can well, claim they that they're can. victims and that they're mm -hmm. oppressed. We, yeah. See, we I, I just fundamentally disagree on that. You're, I don't look, think you're, you're, are... ma you're making the argument. Look, you're basically saying... I agree with you that we shouldn't use the oppressor oppressed lens, but I really am oppressed. <laughs> like that is the problem with the lens. Not me. No, not me. I mean, it, maybe in this situation with the Israel and anti-Semitism. Hypothetical me. Yeah. But right. radical me. Well, like so, with like the shoplifting thing, like, but you know, I agree that things should be done. I think it's I think it's far more difficult to solve the widespread cultural systemic problem of you know shoplifting and why certain areas of lower income places are going to have more shoplifting and all stuff i think we should be doing it i just think that's a it's a very long term project where there's obviously very short term things like you know lowering uh, or raising i should say raising the amount of things someone could steal before getting hit with felonies and all that stuff which has very a very short term instant effect on increasing shoplifting because then people are not afraid to do it and that's why all these stores are doing all this stuff i mean people just don't want to live in a society like that and even i mean especially it's not just like you know rich white people on twitter complaining like if you know if you're poor and you know black and you live in one of these areas in cvs where you have to like go to cvs and there's just picture frames of everything because this like shoplifting is <laughs> so bad i mean like who wants to live like that yeah sure no, um, I, I'm, I'm not. Well, two things. Uh, first, IRI. Um, you know, these. Uh, I've been dealing with a lot of efforts to sabotage me professionally in back chain, mm. uh, like literally get me fired uh, from some of I my see. positions. Uh, you know, like I can take heat on Twitter, but it, you know, people are trying to. This is the irony to me. Like uh, I'm literally trying to help Democrats win elections. Uh, you know, play a you more than probably anyone else in the space understand on the ground field work is hard leading canvassing efforts is hard fundraising is hard and yet you know, this is what i spend at least 40 hours a week working on and uh you know i've got people that are trying to basically get me fired from that which is tremendously frustrating um so yeah, you know, that is it's not the Twitter stuff that I care about. It's the attempts to like destroy my character. Um, yeah, you know, secondly, like you're my friend, but uh I just I don't I I cannot excuse the shoplifting at all. Um I've looked into the psychology of this. I'm not convinced that it's usually to feed your family. I think a lot of people do it uh, in the course of a moment because it's fun. I think we're seeing a, a scourge of organized crime. They exist to you know do smash mobs and go do these stores. And I think it's destructive to these communities. So do I have compassion for the material conditions that could be aiding, like adding to this? Of course. And that's a separate discussion. I have no issue at all saying shoplifting is wrong. This organized crime uh, wave that's going on with uh, stealing things from stores is wrong. And we just do not need to enable it on the left because it's it's not hurting corporations. It's hurting communities. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm, I, I definitely don't support support shoplifting in any way at all. It's just it seems like a minor inconvenience for me compared to the bigger issue of why people would steal. And even I agree with you that there are mobs of kids that are organized that are shoplifting and taking stuff. And there's even organized gangs and such. Um, and perhaps some progressive DAs have gone too far with lessening the punishment for shoplifting and that seems to be something that's being discussed in a serious capacity so i'm all ears for all that stuff i would never make excuses for shoplifting in a harpy but i'm always looking at why people commit crimes why do people why would a bunch of kids get together and shoplift what's going on with them because i wasn't interested in doing that when i was their age so i'm, I'm just more interested in the why than the what well, yeah, because you gave fair. an excuse well, I excuse. think people are, are more I think I give people more credit than that than just because you're not going to be punished means you're going to commit a crime. You know, I could probably go push an old lady down and run into the mob and not get caught. But it, it, am I going to do it? No. OK, well, I mean, I would just say I would I wouldn't use the word I wouldn't use the term like inconvenience because I understand that for you. And you said for you, yeah, it's an inconvenience, maybe. But, mm -hmm. you know, if if someone lives in an area, maybe they don't have a car and like the closest grocery store or CVS 
like shuts down because shoplifting is so bad. I mean, that's like a huge problem for their life. I, I, I agree. And if it does create like a food desert or something that could be problematic for the community, I'm sure it does happen. But I feel like there were these talking points that a lot of these stores shut down and they blamed it on uh, loss or whatever it was called. And uh, pretty sure I saw an article not too long ago saying it's that that's not the whole story there. And they, they kind of pointed a finger at shoplifting as an excuse to shut down stores may not be the whole story. Yeah, I saw that, too. And that's really well said. Uh, I found that very convincing personally. Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen articles like that, but I would imagine that if there's a location and there's only one CVS or one grocery store, and mm-hmm. if there's not shoplifting, I would imagine that store would get a lot of business because it's the, like the only one in like a few mile radius. So that makes me think that there has to be shoplifting has to play a big factor in why they would close down because otherwise it'd be making lots of money. Well, I'm sure there are some stores that were just overrun with shoplifting and it wasn't worth it due to the safety of the customers and stuff like that. But I, I feel like it's probably a minor reason why well, a store like CVS shuts down. I, I don't I don't know what the profit margins are for a CVS or for a grocery store. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm guessing they're not massive. So even, a, you know, a, a spike in shoplifting that reduces their, you know, earnings by five or, or seven percent. I mean, that. That could just be enough to say, okay, this 5% is too much. Shut it down. I'd have to look it up. I don't know. I mean, businesses shut down for all sorts of reasons. And I feel like we're all kind of assuming here. It it could be (laughs) they overexpanded. They they just there. It was it just wasn't a right. Well, regardless of. Yeah. So even if regardless of whether that's the the only reason or not, I mean, we should all Mm -hmm. not want to live in a society where you have to, you know, pick up a picture frame of toilet paper because (laughs) the shoplifting is so bad. I agree. Um, yeah. So, but I want to go back to something you said, Brianna, which I agree with, and I'm very happy that you said it, which is that, you know, and I said this a bunch, that if we ex- if you ignore the extremists on your side, that just allows them to kind of go grow out of control. And it kind of creates this idea that like, oh, well, everyone must agree because no one's kind of pushing back on the extremism. This is true on both uh, the left and the right. And I was curious if you agree with that idea, IRI, that we should like you should you be calling out the extremists on the left? Well, just to be clear, and just and I'll let him answer it. My statement yes. was I really struggle with with understanding what proportion is appropriate. Sure. Because I think zero is clearly not appropriate. But on the other side, you're literally talking about fascism. And as a public figure who's trying to you know, provide um, you know, to build coalitions in in the party. I I struggle every day with what what my role is with that. Well, before you answer, because right, you're kind of framing this in a very interesting way, which mm-hmm. I think is what everyone does, and it's kind of why these extremists don't get called out. Is that unfortunately, like the way it seems like a lot of politics works, is that if you're on the right, you'll point to the left wing extremist and you'll say, hey. This is the entire left, and you'll try to use this broad brush to paint everyone on the left as the extremist. And then the inverse of that is true. If you're on the left, you point to the extremists on the right. You say, hey, everyone on the right is one of these you know, uh, fascist extremists. You try to paint everyone like that. And so because that happens, it makes people on the left and the right gun shy to call out the extremists on their side because it just gets perceived as ammunition for the other side. You know, We saw this a lot uh, with Anna Kasparian you know, with her birthing person tweet. Where like the number one complaint that I saw from people to the left wasn't necessarily her tweet. It was that, you know, Ben Shapiro retweeted it. Like a right wing person used this complaint as ammunition against my team. And so is there a way to like kind of call out people on your side without falling prey to this team playing attitude? Well, I, I lean towards what Brianna said, where I feel the times more valuable and leads to more results by trying to rally the troops and avoid punching people on my team and point and woke scolding. Um, yeah. So it, for is that me, what I'm you were more... saying, Brad? That's not what I interpreted you saying. But... Oh, it's, it's, I, I think that that is, I, I agree with you. That is the best course of action is to not woke scold. I agree with that. No, no, no. Yeah, but... like... Okay. But that's not, wait, I thought you were saying, Ira, that you shouldn't, you should be spending like the majority of your time rallying the troops instead of calling out like the crazies on your side. 
Well, yeah, yeah, because the crazies are just that. They're crazies. And so, <laughs> you know, why, you know, do you argue with the guy standing in front of Subway pouring a two liter on his head or you just keep yeah, moving the, about yeah, it? But if the, you know? if the guy at the corner of Subway pouring a two liter on his head has 44,000 mm -hmm live viewers then yes right. you should be well if he's poisoning your entire I, movement then yeah you should be i mean i just i don't see their impact as gigantic i really don't i i really? when i hear like yeah I, this is something that i just because if you go out in the real world and you ask people do you know who hassan piker is 99 out of 100 i have no idea no idea and I used to do this on Omega. I would ask people if they know who Hassan is, then no idea. And these are just randos on their phones, like going on the internet, messing around. So I think the vast majority of people that are involved in the political process are not influenced by people like Hassan. Now, you guys might disagree with me, but this is what I, the feeling I get watching the news, interacting with normies. And these are the people who vote. And also, I'd rather try to get they're the, they're the people who vote now though don't you think no the young think people hassan, who are watching hassan are going to grow no. up and vote one day one day but th but right now they're 15 years old and they're three years away from being able to vote you know yeah, but I mean? we're they're shaping their morality for their entire lives well I, I you know i maybe i'm more forgiving but when i was 15 i thought some stupid things too and i quickly grew up as as uh, time went on so my the people that had influence on me at that age didn't seem to stick with me my whole life. And I think you guys would probably agree your 15 year old influences probably didn't have a lasting influence on you. Maybe, maybe I'm well, yes, the exception. G Jesus was my 15 year old influence <laughs> and I think it served me very well. <laughs> well, well, it I seemed agree. to push you in the wrong, in, in the other direction. Are look, you I don't, I, look, I, I'm, well, no, I'm a, I'm an atheist, but I, okay. Look, so I, Hassan I, is then, it's, that argument is then Hassan is pushing people in the exact opposite direction as they mature. Then. No, well, I do, a, I do think you've, you. Look, I do think you form your moral compass when you're young, obviously. Hmm. Like, I instinctively hate lying, and I know that I hate lying because I was raised religious, and I felt it was a sin. So just intuitively, I feel strong discomfort about being dishonest, which I think is good. I want people to feel discomf discomfort in being dishonest. You raise well, a generation of people who feel no discomfort at being dishonest, and all of a sudden, society is falling apart. You raise a bunch of people who are not only un, un, not uncomfortable about being dishonest, but think shoplifting is great and they feel good about it, you're going to run into trouble. Yeah, like I agree that internet politics and mainstream politics are not 100% aligned. I mean, we talk about this, we talked about this in terms of Bernie support, Vivek support, Yang support. Um, so, I, but I think that's going to change over time because internet politics, I agree, is like still like the young people's game and the young people are still not the primary voting base, but they will be. Yeah. And I think the Hassans of the world and the other political pundits in the world will become just as popular as Fox News or any of these other, uh, or MSNBC or any of these other things going forward over the next 20, 10, 20 years. I don't think that mm. internet politics is going to stay detached forever. It's going to grow and grow and grow. And it does concern me that I think Hassan's like the biggest political streamer in the world. And the, the biggest political streamer in the world is a radical socialist and promoting these ideas. And we're seeing them manifest on college campuses. I mean, I went to a very fairly liberal college, you know, in the late 2000s. And like, I would never have seen any of this stuff. Any of these like attitudes manifesting this oppressor, oppressy stuff manifesting on my college campuses, everyone was still very much like a more classically liberal, pro free speech, you know, kind of person. So I, I don't think you can just dismiss this as like as something that's just going to like go away on its own. Look, and I, I think we might have had this conversation six months ago, and both of you might not have even acknowledged that the lens existed. Now no. I feel like we've made no. some. Well, uh, <laughs> look, we've had conversations like that. We we've had these conversations before. So, so look, the let's. I want to I want to bring in something else because you, you mentioned psychology, Brianna. Do you want? Do you know about the locus of control, the internal or external locus of control? Why don't you share it with me? This sounds amazing. okay. So, look, there there's two ways that you can look at life. You can look at life as you have a, a an Ex, it has an external locus of control over you that things happen to you that you you cannot get past 
or you can have an internal locus of control. You, you feel like you control your destiny. You shape your life to some extent. I do feel like the oppressor oppressed lens gives people the ability to adopt this external locus of control. Nothing, anything that they do is, is not going to affect their lives. They're powerless, uh, under a system of oppression. And I just, I don't think even, even if that's true to some extent, and obviously I'm not Pollyanna about it. There is, there is some level of oppression that goes on a, around us. I don't think it's helpful to teach people that there's no possible way that they can overcome that oppression. Do you think people are teaching uh, their daughters that there's, quote, no possible way to overcome, say, structural sexism? Yes. I, I think they do. And I think you're a bit guilty of this yourself. I think you kind of inadvertently teach people that. I I don't agree with that. I think I think it's something you that is there. It's a background radiation in your life, but life goes on. Like you've got to, you have to keep going forward and we all have to, like there was a, a phrase to come out of this uh, Hamas Palestine horror uh, that was in the John Oliver clip. It's like, we're all doomed to live together, which I think is uh, is pretty appropriate. Like we mm -hmm. ultimately are all going to have to get along. Uh, you know, from my point of view, respectfully, I see um, a thought process with y'all that I think consistently dismisses what everyone else goes through. And um, I, I'm not going to tell you there's not excesses on, on my own side. There are, but like, like I think you, your calculus makes you think there's no problem at all, or it's overstated or the best course of action is to shut up about it. And I, I just don't agree with that. No, look, I, and I do see people further right than us, obviously making that argument. Like they want to make the argument that it doesn't exist. I'm not one of those people. I think it does exist. Or that I it think, should exist. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is even worse. I look as a, as it's important that we know what the reality is because sure. if, if there is this structural sexism and I'm just talking about sexism, but it could be racism or homophobia, any one of these things, if there is a certain amount that is insurmountable for the individual to overcome. And, and in our past, there was obviously women weren't even allowed in certain universities or professions. Okay. So that's an insurmountable hurdle for them to overcome. It's, it's important to know that if you believe it's an insurmountable hurdle and it's not an insurmountable hurdle, you're doing yourself a complete disservice because you, you, if, if the hurdle is insurmountable, you're a fool to try and beat it. You should, the, the logical course of action is to hunker down and live with it. You want to respond? I no, I, well, I'd like to see you engage with my point, uh, but I will just, I'll, I will engage with yours by saying, um, you know, like, look, my own life, I've got a house, I've got a really nice car collection, I do very well for myself, I have a job I think matters, I'm in a good marriage, uh, you know, like, I feel like I was handed a pretty tough deck, and I've made the most of it, right? Um, sure. So I don't think my own life has been insurmountable and I would never say that to anyone else. Um, I think one of the things I admire about Republicans and one of the, the things that has really served me well in my career is a good old sense of personal responsibility that, yeah, look, I was handed a tough hand, but my destiny is in my own hands and I've got to make the most of it and uh, make the best decisions I can in a moment for that. Right. So I don't think it's insurmountable. Um, but I do, again, want to say, I see a pattern with both of you that I think you structurally downplay these systems. And I think your solution that you're consistently advocating is don't talk about it well, or no, look no, at look. how crazy the people are that are, are advocating for this. And my, again, my position with, is, look, yeah. just to interrupt, my position sure. is to assess the problem for what it is not to downplay it but to accurately assess it so that, okay. that's something completely different like well it, so yeah i was gonna say like i yeah i was i agree we need to assess the problem figure out what it is um and i just saw you know uh someone on twitter posted there's massive meta-analysis that was even showing that 
you know, uh, uh, biases against women in hiring has basically dropped to zero while biases in for hiring men is basically just increased. Supposedly, now you can look at this. I don't know. I've been said I don't as a massive that. meta analysis of this, you know, of like 80 studies or something. Um, but my position on like how to quote fix the problem is that we need to be pushing for the you know, a a liberal version, a liberalism version of the, you know, race blind, gender blind society where we say, okay, if, if you're a man or a woman, you can, you know, do whatever you want and be whatever you want and your gender doesn't necessarily control you, and we shouldn't be advocating along the lines of gender or race. And I don't, I see like that used to be the last position broadly. And that right now I see, and this is kind of like the Hassan camp, this is the kind of pro-Palestine Hamas camp, is this moving away from the race, uh, gender blind liberal attitude to the leftist attitude of that stuff doesn't work. You know, liberalism doesn't work. We all need to align along identity politics and, you know, say, you know, we need to do specific things to make everything better for women at the cost of the male oppressors. And that's where I see like the difference here. I hear it. How, how are I, we downplaying? What's a, that's a. Well, she's saying that we're downplaying it because like we had the conversation in the past about you know, how much sex Yeah, that's exists a really good example. In, the video in game uh, yeah. industry, which is one of the most hostile, uh, like documentable, like clear hostile industries for women to work. Um, look, I don't think y'all are bad people, but uh, I you. think walking into that conversation, it was again and again, you were convinced this was not a problem, right? You're convinced like it's overstated or you need examples. And I, well, I just look, you do need all... examples. Sure, you do need examples think... if you're going to assess, assess it accurately. I feel like we're going down a wrong tunnel that's not a productive place to go. My assessment of who y'all are is I think you have a slight bias against seeing this stuff. No big deal. My own husband has this. Doesn't make you bad people. Mm. I just think y'all have this bias. Well, well the, the bias for the oppressor oppressed lens is to see everyone as an oppressor or oppressed. That's the bias. And, and I think that's fair. And I, I think mean, one yeah. of the reasons mm -hmm. I talk less about these issues today, and I certainly don't talk about it the way I did in the Gamergate era, is I am convinced that those tactics are not resulting in better public policy for anyone. I can see barely any evidence that anything we did in the Gamergate era made that industry better for women. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, Sitch has a meta analysis that shows it got better. I mean, <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> he does. I mean, yeah, but why, you shouldn't dismiss it offhand just because look, of your, your personal experience. You said it was on Twitter. I would need to look at this. Okay, I'll, I'll send look you, at yeah, it. I'll you well, can look, invite me back on the show. If you if you are if you're looking to if your whole goal was to improve the situation, yes, and Sitch has a meta analysis <laughs> that proves that the situation has improved. Yes. Haven't you achieved your goal? Why aren't you happy about that? You did it. Twitter is not a reputable source. Okay. It's, Show me the it, analysis. Okay. I will, yeah, I will that's look fine. at that's it fine. and we will right. have another conversation. But I want to say so, putting aside like, you know, how much sexism still exists, how much of a problem it is, and all that stuff. Sure. You know, one of the, you know, the famous lines, I get it was actually, I think it was pre Gamergate, was, you know, Anita Sarkeesian saying, you know, everything is racist, everything is sexist, and it's your job to find it and point it out. I mean, would you agree that that attitude, is a bad attitude to teach people because if you teach them that, they're just going to look for it regardless of whether it exists and they'll find it regardless of whether it exists or not. Yeah, I think, I think, like I said, it's not that I think you can't look at situations and and see ways that it's problematic in a million different ways. It's that I think is a, a tactic to make the world better for women. I think that going to war on culture issue after culture issue after culture issue has not resulted in better public policy. And I think that if we do use that same energy and pushed for, say, uh, better day like daycare subsidies for working moms, I think that would have been a much better uh, use of well, our energy. What I'm getting at is like... If you Amen. tell yourself that you're going to find something, if you tell yourself that sexism and racism exist everywhere, aren't you just setting yourself up to find it? Like regardless of whether it exists or not? Yeah, but it's probably going to exist. 
Yeah, but how, but that's the problem is that you can't like human the human brain is just a pattern recognition machine. I mean, I you know I'm sure you guys know about like the Bible code where they'll like look into the Bible and they'll apply some algorithm and they can say, oh, the Bible tells the future. And it's like, well, no. If you look at any pattern, if you look at an ink blot, a cloud, anything, the human brain will force it to make sense. So look at a pattern and, and derive whatever you want from it. And so if you tell yourself everything is sexist, everything is racist, then yeah, your brain will find it there, whether so it's there this or not. Is, this is what fundamentally I don't understand. And I don't mean to get spicy, but <laughs> okay. I debated John Doyle. Uh, who yes. is a pretty far right figure, right? He is at sexist the, and racist, yes. At the University of South Carolina right. a few days ago. And I took his complaints seriously about uh, men getting addicted to pornography mm -hmm. and how it was hurting their lives. And I didn't sit there and go, you know, because women have XYZ, this doesn't matter and this doesn't exist. I looked into those claims. There was science that backed them up, even though the numbers I think he's using are overstated. If you watch that debate, I spent the majority of it agreeing that what he was talking about was a problem and I heard it and I gave him policy solutions that I thought the left and the right could work on together to make men's lives better. Like that's where I'm coming from, from mm -hmm. this. I don't think for women to win, men need to lose. And I think that's one of the, the limits of Gamergate era feminism. I think what is frustrating from my end about this conversation is I don't feel that same respect. I feel like you're tendency is to say this doesn't exist this isn't a problem well, well, we're not this doesn't we're not exist we you never don't need to look that. at it from this lens this is wrong don't talk about it this way this is not helpful right. well would it really kill you mm -hmm. to just say you know what i think it's pretty clear the women in the game industry like every one of them we're telling them like uh, we're seeing reports we're seeing studies we can look at the hiring numbers we can look at the rate at which they leave women in the game industry are probably not having a great time that matters to me why can't you mm -hmm. show women the same respect i showed john doyle so you know we just watched this conversation on mm -hmm. sunday uh between hassan and ethan and a big part of the conversation was which i pointed out we point out many times and i think part of why the conversation looks so bad for hassan is that I feel like when we watched it, like Ethan is willing to basically compromise on a lot of issues or think right. about a lot of issues. And Hassan is like completely obstinate on right. everything. You know, there's no bending. So I don't want to like fall into that. That's how like, I feel right now. Right. I understand yeah. that's how you feel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's why I brought it up. So because I, I I hear listen, I hear you. Okay. Let me okay. tap into my feminine Great. energy. I hear you. <laughs> I understand. Right. No, so I get it. I'm and I'm empathetic. So I don't want to like be in that camp. Um, but I guess. Regarding what you're saying, you know, I'm very uh, untrusting of people's personal experiences. And I know that we, because we had this whole conversation about the sexism in, in industries and in the gaming industry specifically. And I believe basically what I said multiple times in that conversation is, you know, I don't know the clear facts on that. I'd have to see data on it. I don't trust what people just say. And I've never done the deep dive into that area myself. So I don't feel like it's productive necessarily for me and you to argue about how much sexism exists in the video game area or these other areas, because mm -hmm. I don't, I, and as I said, I don't know the answer to that question. Right. So that's why I guess I'm trying to focus on like other things of, regardless of how much sexism there is, this, the psychology of how people perceive this is definitely an issue. Right. So. I'm and how so, we determine the actual level is, look, we wouldn't expect you to believe our assessment of the level of sexism, racism, or homophobia, which do exist, obviously. Well, we it's would not never even, say it's that not it even doesn't. ours. Like, if, you know, there are a lot of people, there's a lot of white people who say, oh, I've experienced tons of racial discrimination in job hiring. I've heard people I know who are like, oh, my boss told me that they wouldn't hire me or they wouldn't give me a raise because I'm white and they need, you know, a black person or whatever. And, does that mean that there's like the entire country is rooted in some sort of racism against white people? I don't think those personal stories on their own paint that picture. You, you know, you need to have some kind of study or data to show that information, right? Yeah. 
No, a, I think that's fair. Level. And I th- I do, I think where we would probably agree is this oppression Olympics dynamic where you're trying to decide, like bringing it back to the Israel Hamas war. Let's be really clear. Everyone is hurting in this situation. I have Palestinian American friends and they see this and their hearts are broken. I have progressive Jewish friends and they see this and their hearts are broken. They feel mm-hmm. kind of betrayed by their own sides. Everyone is here and in pain. And I feel like one of the reasons this particular conversation is so hard to move forward on is because the other side won't acknowledge anyone else's humanity. What I see today as far as advocating for women's rights is the exact same thing. If you're not willing to look at the other side and look at the suicide stats that men are going through or this pornography addiction thing, which is much worse than I would have guessed once I started yeah. looking into it. If we can't start seeing each other's humanity and trying to like come up with this playbook, which is I'm hurt, I'm right, you should not exist, you should shut up and give me power, that's not going to get us anywhere. And it's it's not a formula for anything but internet bickering, which is why since, to bring the conversation back to IRI, I think this is why both of us spend so much of our efforts on public policy and winning elections. This is a way to look at these issues and garner political power and get specific policies passed. This is a much better use of everyone's energy. And this is mm-hmm. what is my professional goal. Yeah, no, and, and I and I understand that. And I and you know, we, me and Adam obviously have different, you know, we're interested in different things. We're more interested in like the psychology and cultural aspects of of these political situations. I think from the beginning, you know, we're not like big policy uh, wonks, but you know, it's kind of like going back to sort of like the importance of calling out the bad actors. You know, we, we saw this on the right where and I'm sure you guys have seen this. Both of you guys have seen this a lot, which is, I don't think a lot of Republican politicians and a lot of Republican pundits, you know, they don't seem to like Trump. And yet they're afraid to call him out and they're afraid to call it election denial stuff because they know that the base, the Trump base is like so big, right? And when you don't call out these sorts of things, it seems like it just creates a snowball effect of it getting bigger and bigger until it dominates the movement. And I guess that's what I'm afraid of uh, on the left is that I know it's not quite there yet, but if there is this kind of attitude of like the left can't get rid of its bigotry, you know, whether it's anti-Semitism or whether it's the oppressor oppressed narrative or whatever, that that will take over the left. And I feel like, you know, the right went through this historically, obviously, I mean, I'm sure we, you know, there'd be a disagreement about how effective they've been, but the right, because we used to live in a country where, you know, black people were second class citizens and racism was like so heavy on people's mind, you know, there, the right seems a lot more sensitive of like, okay, we need to you know, kick out at least the explicit racist in our party, you know, maybe they'll use dog whistles or whatever, because that's so, that's so tip top in Americans' minds, where like America never had really a threat of socialist. And so because America's never had that threat, I don't feel like the left feels a need to kind of expel socialism and this toxicness out of the left-wing parties in America. Yeah. Well, can can I just say, I, I just, look at it from a bird's eye view. I don't think the responsibility is on you and I to call out people. I feel like that is a waste of time. For me, it's about what led people to this road. So like communism, socialism, these are kids who, as Brianna said, have grown up without a functioning government. And we have a Congress that can't get anything done. They're at each other's throats. We have old laws dictating our southern border when it was single males coming across from Mexico looking for work. And we have a refugee crisis. We have an internet that's out of control with no regulation at all. AI is about to make it 100 times worse. And so for me, it's about let's update the laws. Let's get Congress functioning. Let's get gerrymandering out so we get real people in Congress as examples of how to get along. That's why I don't spend my time trying to call people out. I don't ask the right to do that. I don't ask them. I don't expect it on the left. The only reason I got into it now is, number one, I can get some attention by leaning into it on Twitter. And these people already hate me. So I might as well just pound them hard and hit the hornet's nest and see what happens to raise my voice. Because my goal is always just to make this stuff more accessible. I don't want kids to get their news from TikTok. And 
nobody's watching CNN like me. It's all Medicare Advantage sign-up commercials and Viagra pills. So the goal for me, and I assume Brianna as well, is to make this stuff more accessible. And that's why yep. she works with streamers because we want people to get the news because like you guys, I feel that if you read an article or if you watch a five minute segment about a story, you're gonna actually see a little nuance and maybe go on some research on your own and learn something. But if you just watch a 30 second TikTok video of Hassan saying Israel is committing genocide, then you're not gonna get the news. So I don't, I don't mean to dismiss what you guys are saying, but for me, it's all a waste of time to try to call people out. Well. Uh, yeah, like if, if that's not what you're interested in, that's fine. Um, you know, I don't watch, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't watched enough of your back catalog to be like, you've called out all the Republicans, Bob. I don't know the answer to that question, right? And I'll take your word for it. Um, but don't you, don't you think IRI and this is, uh, so this is where I really struggle. And well, wait, let me, let me just finish. Oh, let me just go finish. ahead. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Um, which is that, so, you know, so I'll, yeah, I'll definitely take your word for it that you're not out there, you know, demanding that people on the right call out the racist or the authoritarians or, or whatever. Um, and I agree with you because the way that I look at the world is that you have all these extremist forces at all times that are always trying to pull society in one extreme direction. And then there's some kind of environmental change that allows that extremist movement to like sink its hooks in. And so, yeah, like, you know, income problems, material problems, the fact that people, there is income inequality and, and inflation, and especially among young kids who don't feel like they can live the life that their parents lived, where they can, you know, get a job and get married and get a house and all this stuff. Like all these problems create an environment that makes it ripe for extremists and any left or right wing event to kind of like sink their hooks in and say, society sucks, society's falling apart, we need to have some kind of revolution to change everything. So I agree with you that you want to change those conditions to eliminate those problems. But do you agree that like, that's a long term thing? And that's going to take like years to change. And so we should be advocating and, and changing that. But you also need to have something that deals with like, these extremist movements and these extreme groups short term. And one of the ways to to deal with that is to be like, listen, we're not like these crazy people over here. They're not they're not with us. They're not part of our movement, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I just don't know how effective that is. And I think you're no match for the TikTok algorithm. Well, part of that would be to I mean, honestly, I, I'm in favor of just getting rid of TikTok. I mean, that <laughs> well, would be a, a short term solution. I I understand. My argument would be to grow your voice instead of uh, going after other people, which is what I rarely do. It's it's like more about how do I grow my voice? How do I grow my influence? I feel is a better use of time than showing people that someone else is wrong. Perhaps we disagree. And I, I don't mean to give you the impression it's a, a waste of your time to do that. Like if there's somebody making racist jokes in your office, then yeah, mm -hmm. by all means, you should sit them down and say, hey, man, I don't know if you realize, but like you're saying some racist shit, bro. <laughs> and it's making everyone uncomfortable. <laughs> but I think we have to take care of our own homes in that regard, trying to influence society by calling out Hassan on his takes or something. I think the the influence is minimal. And I don't kid myself that I'm having any influence in in doing that. I just, for me personally, I just uh, had to say something. That's why, why I said is you're your a name? Moron. I'm really important if you don't <laughs> have any influence. I don't because agree with that. I think it's, it's ironic. ironic. It's yeah. to make people drop their guard and like, well, think this guy doesn't take himself so seriously. So maybe I'll listen a little more to regardless him. Regardless oh of how influential Hassan is, you mm -hmm. know, obviously there has been, and I would assume that you both agree, there has been some kind of political shift starting in the 2012, 2014, 2016, some time period. There has been some shift on the left and the left's ideology, at least on college campuses, at least on the internet, where it's moved from liberalism to, you know, whatever you want to call wokeism, whether you want to call it socialist or not. So sure. something is occurring. And to me, yeah. I don't think kind of, and I understand you want to, you know, and that's fine. If your attitude is, I want to stop that by raising up my own voice, that's fine. But that's a little bit different than, than kind of the attitude of like, well, we just stick our head in the sand. It's not a big deal. Or it's not happening. Um, I don't, I don't disagree that it's it's happening. I think people are drawn to socialism and abandoning capitalism because they don't see any opportunity to own a home. They don't see any way to get out of debt from student loans. They've uh, ran up all their credit cards. 
and they're they can't find love because they're on Instagram all day long and they don't talk to humans. So I, I think they're looking for excuses why. And they say, well, capitalism, man, you know, yeah. the, America bad, America's imperialism or whatever. So mm -hmm. I, I don't disagree that that's happening. I just say you're not going to convince them, I think, by by browbeating them or even confronting them on it. I think what you have to do is is change their situation. You know, it's kind of like you get some change in their pocket and you get them out of debt. Next thing you know, they're like, you know, capitalism's not so bad. I I hear what you're saying. I, I think that's fair. I, I think what I would say to you is I would imagine if say I went to me through or say to IRI. your, yeah, IRI, I think IRI, if I went through your tweets from 2016, and I know if you went through my tweets for 2016, you would see a lot of scorn for the Republicans like going, y'all have got some real racists in your party. You deserve <laughs> this. What's going on? Like, come on, grab them by the P word. I mean, like what's going on? Why can't y'all, you deserve this. You never called out any of the young cancer in your own party. Uh, you would look the other way towards anti-Muslim se sentiment, the sexism, all of that. And this is what you get. Of course you deserve that. And now I think we're in a situation where obviously it's nowhere near that bad. It's nowhere near that bad. But if we could go back in a time machine to the aftermath of Bush too, and like look at the way the Republican Party was shaping itself, if they had been less interested in getting their own power and more interested in getting the right message together, like, oh, what's his name? Uh, Reince, uh, Reince Priebus. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, he had that really famous uh, analysis of the Republican Party that he put together together after uh, John McCain loss. And it was this devastating document saying, look, the Republican Party has got to change course. We have way too much uh, uh, racism in our party. It's pushing out Latinos. If we don't move away from these culture issues, there's no real future to the party. How did the Republicans react to that? They fired everyone involved with that report. They marginalized the people involved with it. And now we have a party that is, in my view, uh, more and more synonymous with white nationalism. Again, I'm not saying we have the same proportionality of problem, but we do have a problem. And I I really struggle with what is the correct amount of my energy to call this stuff out. We both agree that showing a better way forward is the most effective way. We both agree that getting young people uh, focused on real world politics is a better outlet of their energy. But there's got to be some proportion of what we do that when people are just being like blatantly anti-Semitic, I don't look the other way and say nothing because I want to win 2024. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. And I mean, I think speaking up is fine. Um, I just, you know, Sitch, not to put words in your mouth, but I felt like you were saying that there needs to be a much bigger focus on pushing back on this stuff because it's it's going to become a poison that gets out of control. Whereas it sounds more like Brianna saying, listen, we have to speak up and once in a while and when something goes too far, but that's the exception and that's not the trend. I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding. I mean, I would point. like an ideal world. This is obviously never going to happen. I mean, I would be totally fine with like both the left and the right spending 50% of the time advocating for the things they want to advocate for and 50% of the time you know, trying to expel the crazy extremists from their <laughs> their sides. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. These are fellow Americans, right? That's all. I'm not I saying put in them it. in the gulag. I'm just saying, I like, know, I know. Be but like, I'm, these I'm people saying... are not. You shouldn't be breaking bread with these people. You shouldn't be trying to create a coalition well, with these people. What what I, creates I, this, like, these extremists, though? Such a, that's the. What's the I, I, I feel like every. I, it's it's the right. well. well it's the material conditions plus they're being indoctrinated by fucking assholes in college campuses. Okay, and on it, sure. Hold and on. on Twitch. Is it my, see, my question is always, which is, which is more prevalent because look, if the material conditions are, are horrible and everyone says that they are, but you know, I follow the, I follow the financial press and stuff and they keep saying, well, oh, material conditions are really not that bad at all. So uh, it's, it's, it's tough because there's conflicting reports out there. So I just, I don't know which is, which is more prevalent, the ideology or the material conditions. Well, and I just, I feel right. like there could be a doom cycle going here. Like, it feels like we're all saying, 
and you probably will agree with this like we have big problems right we have big sure. problems to solve and how do we solve those in liberal democracies right through some sort of electoral process well mm -hmm. there are people who they're revolutionaries they don't want to participate into the elect in the electoral process so we either try to de-radicalize them so they're not revolutionaries and they join us in this project to help us solve these big problems that would make it much easier just like if all the people if all the young people who could vote actually voted and voted for policies that we all agree would be good then that would make things a lot easier i i feel like the radicalism is what's standing in the way and and part hmm. whether it's ideology or whether it's material conditions look i i think it's probably a bit of both and i mean you solve the material conditions by solving the radicalism right well see but the, the, i would disagree on the radicalism because even on the right i don't see it like that i i don't see people following trump and maga because they're being radicalized and they're white supremacists or something i think it's their material conditions and maybe that's me uh, distilling things too much, but I feel like most of our problems in this country stem from people's uh, lack of access to things they want, you know, whether it's healthcare, mental health care, going to a therapist or doctor or a little change in their pocket. I mean, people are so much happier when their material conditions are improved. And so uh, maybe it's me belittling the problem, well, but I just don't feel like there's these poet, these influencers out there that are really riling people up and, and like, getting them into something crazy but obviously i agree to disagree with you on that yeah but i mean i'd assume you'd agree that well first of all it's not to be like hyper specific it's not quite the material conditions that creates this it's people's anxieties and fears that create this now people's anxieties and fears obviously if they have bad material conditions that will definitely be a huge influence on that in the first place right. um but i assume that you agree that regardless of what's causing it um, that whatever allows this to happen, whether it's the material conditions or not, that that just makes people ripe for pick, you know, being picked off by these ideologies, right? Sure. Yeah, so, it sets okay. them up to fall into like the it ideology. sets them up for these ideologies, the, especially I, I specifically agree. the oppressor oppressed ideology, right? Well, no, but okay, they're so, for easy answers, they're looking for an easy right. someone to blame, not in the mirror. For well, sure, it sounded like you both were against the idea of banning TikTok. No. Oh, against the idea of banning it? Yeah. Like, I'm in favor of banning I, it. Sounds like you guys are against it. I, I think it's I a didn't tool say that's that. being used. Oh, okay, okay. Wait, what's, what's the time? Both of you tell no, me go position. ahead. IRI, please go first. Well, I, I think it's a tool being used by China to manipulate discourse uh, mm -hmm. quietly and, and slowly. And you're seeing that with the Hamas conflict right now, where you yeah, can, right. there's data out there that Hamas posts are getting promoted. They have like 40 times the posts and the reach than a stand with israel post or something like that and mm -hmm. and so i think it's just a tool that's going that's being used to manipulate and don't right. get it twisted i think that our domestic social media is used to manipulate us in other ways whether it's to like the new jeep wrangler or to hate joe biden i mean all these tools are being used to manipulate us for one reason or another but i don't i don't know about banning it because i i feel like we can regulate these things people love tiktok and and it's a wonderful tool but it's being manipulated that's exactly my view. Word for mm -hmm. word, have almost nothing to add. I I would say, um, I I would say that, as someone who is pretty serious about national security, I think we've been far too laissez faire about controlling our own information space in this country. I think you are a fool if you don't realize that ByteDance is absolutely synonymous by the PRC. And yes, Facebook has done horrible things for this country. I've been talking about them on my own show, Rocket, which is about to celebrate its 500th episode for a decade now. Um, you know, but the thought of the Chinese uh, government having a direct pipeline into what our youngest Americans are seeing and hearing, any reasonable person should have extreme reservations about that. And it speaks to uh, our own utter unwillingness to regulate uh, the tech industry because the boomers that are in charge of these committees, they're completely unqualified. There was a woman that my mom went to for home economics class in Laurel, Mississippi, that made it to Congress. And she was on the tech regulation committee, like ruling over a whole bunch of this stuff, wholly unqualified, 
utterly stupid statements on this. Mm-hmm. So I, I think technology, like regulation, people always think it means like we're going to hamper the technology uh, industry. No, regulatory clarity can actually aid these industries. You can play a role in making sure it's competitive and everyone has a fair shot to get their products to market. We've just completely forfeited this to big tech. And I think the results have been disastrous. Well, like the way that I look at it is, you know, when you have Twitter or X and, you know, Facebook and all these other, you know, companies, like these are American companies who, you know, generally their motivation is to make money and that can lead them down doing things that are bad for our society, obviously, if you're just driven by profit. And I do feel confident that in America, we can regulate American uh, businesses in such a fashion to pre- you know to prevent you know these kinds of abuses or to fix problems maybe that are cropping up in social media but when you have tiktok which you know as you said is basically just an arm of like the chinese communist government i mean i don't see why i would trust regulations to have any impact on any of that stuff when they're not even motivated by making money they're motivated by hurting america <laughs> And I don't know why we should allow that. Yeah. Well, we we can regulate um, who controls the information within America. I mean, can we? I mean, look at like Twitter is a Twitter is a very interesting example because you know Elon Musk, you know he he buys the entire company, and mm-hmm. for like you know even like years after him buying it, the algorithm is such this black box of like tangled yarn that years later, there's still like things that are going on the algorithm that he's like, Oh, I didn't even know that this was happening. Right. And so like on one level, I'd be like, yeah, like if we could somehow extract TikTok from, you know, Chinese hands and give it to an American company, if that would even be legal, you know, maybe, but at the other hand, you know, do I trust the algorithms? Even if we did that, there's going to be so much stuff inherent in it. That's going to be toxic. Well, I mean, that's what was good. Trump was offering, I think, Oracle, Larry Ellison to to buy TikTok, mm-hmm. if I'm not if I'm not incorrect. Um, but I mean, I I think if if you if you sell it to an American company and force the American operations to go through an American company, then there's there's got to be ways to keep it. But I think if you ban it, um, people aren't going to understand why. Like they're trying to ban it in certain states right now, and it doesn't seem to be going very well. So I, I just don't mm-hmm. think it's a real solution. For me, it's more about just regulating the internet in general. It's, it's just the Wild West, man. I fight with my chat all the time about this. Like anonymity on the internet is insane. Like I, th- yeah. I think our grandkids will look at this period of time and be like, holy shit, man. You had like middle schoolers killing themselves, and you guys were just like, yeah, it's worth it for me being able to shit post on Twitter or something. It's so... I think well, this is just kind of the Wild West right now. I mean, without getting into a big question about anonymity and being anonymous on the internet, um, should so you're but you would be in favor of forcing TikTok Talk to be sold to an American company and be completely yes. detached. Okay, hundred percent. Okay, should have happened already. Right. Yeah, I okay. agree. I mean, I agree. Yeah, that, that don't you know happen. though, IRI? It's all everyone that uses anonymity on the internet. Every one of them. These are just young, closeted LGBT kids that are just <laughs> using the anonymous mm. accounts because they're Sounds afraid like to be themselves. You're being sarcastic, right? Sounds like. No. <laughs> well, that no. is an argument you hear for sure. It, that, it is like, an argument, and there's some proportion. What do you think of, of it? I, I think it's true to some degree, but I think, look, let's be honest. Uh, a lot of people online are, um, they're assholes and their psychological motivation for being anonymous is they want to engage in asymmetric warfare where they are attacking your reputation and you cannot attack theirs. And it's fun for them. They're hunting you like it's a World of Warcraft monster that they're trying to level up and take down. Uh, that's their motivation. So I think it's sometimes true, but I don't think it's the majority case. I 100% agree. It's about reputation destruction. That's yep. what it well, is. And when, and when you're... Uh, anonymous you don't have a reputation to destroy so you're an effective you're a kamikaze suicide bomber <laughs> i i just think it brings out the worst in us like it's kind of like having an invisibility cloak a lot of people would do shitty things that they could be invisible it just yeah. being anonymous just kind of brings out the worst in society i think in general because um, 
Yeah. We'll keep going. The ring of yeah, Gaijis. That's it. Uh, well, Look, I, I, you know, I agree conceptually with everything you're saying. I mean, obviously, that's, you know, being anonymous is what kind of helps people be, uh, engage in this behavior. Um, but in terms of like getting rid of that anonymity, I would be more confident and, and safe and feel better to do that if we lived in a society that was like really heavily rooted culturally in protecting uh, free speech and liberal principles. And the fact that we had this kind of radical shift in the cancel culture to me makes me like, oh, well, I definitely don't want to change, you know, the ability to be anonymous on the internet because of this cultural shift. Um, yeah, I feel you there. There is a concern right now uh, when it comes to free speech and the protection of that. Uh, I, I just, you know, to counteract Brianna's argument that and I do hear this argument that it, it does provide a platform and a space for people to be themselves who otherwise can't be that person in real life. I just think it would bring down the temperature in general. And so yeah. perhaps trans people would be more accepted in society if, if people weren't just complete assholes on the internet eight hours a day and, and then oh. they go into the real world and it's hard for them to shake that, you know what I mean? And they don't see terrible things. I, I also think like this this conflict right now is um, is made worse in Israel and Gaza because of anonymity on the internet. And who knows oh, who yeah. the hell these bots are that are spreading all this info and, and all these crazy videos and stuff and just inflaming tensions. I think if everybody had to stand up and say what they thought with their with their identity, probably the temperature would be way lower right now. As a cartoon character, I agree with you <laughs> that the temperature <laughs> would be lower. But well, actually, actually, I don't agree. The temperature would be lower for certain views. I don't think, like, you know, I, I do think we've kind of gone past peak wokeness, and I'm hoping it will just continue declining. But in that time period of, you know, peak wokeness, uh, you know, a few years ago, I don't think, like, if everyone had their name attached to their account, I don't think any of that would be different. I think it'd be exactly the same. Because really? the temperature would only go down on, like, opinions that are deemed socially not acceptable there'd still be mobs of people trying to get you canceled for saying something that you know goes against you know someone's uh cultural norm and if the cultural norm is to basically capitulate to a mob of people calling for your head i i think that's completely inappropriate i don't know well, i i yeah go, go ahead all right no 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 <laughs> well I, I just think that when when <laughs> out in public I, uh, people are pretty nice to each other in general. You know, they're like, hey, yeah. man, it, I just think in, it, face to face, like we're all so much nicer to each other and we're more understanding. We're, we're able to listen more. They don't want to get and, punched. It's a threat. Well, of yeah, but I mean, <laughs> maybe that's a good thing, right? And that doesn't seem to exist on the internet. Yeah, but that's not going to exist on the internet, even if you're not anonymous, because you're still, you know, thousands to some of degree miles it will, away though. from someone. I mean, well, like, to some, some degree, I guess, but not really. Like... I don't think that people facing consequences for mm -hmm. their positions is the worst thing in the entire world, right? I've said stupid stuff. I've certainly, you know, had to apologize for it. Adam, I apologize to you publicly just a few, uh, it was a few months ago, right? Uh, I I don't think that's bad for the soul or your character to do that. Um, I think that... Um, if this were a world where people had to stand by with their reputation, the shit that they're saying online, I think in a lot of ways it would be better. Um, I know that there is a, I don't mean to you know, dismiss what you're saying, Sitch, but I can take I, it, I, dismiss it. I think, I think that there is a tendency with some people to feel like they're truly victimized. And I've never heard you say anything on this show when I've been on here mm -hmm. uh, that I thought would get you fired or like truly get a mob after you. I, I just I don't hear you doing that. I think you could show your face very proudly on this show. Um, so I look at our, our disagreement, though. And, yeah. and, you know, I don't like to bring it up, but it, it was people were coming after me in a mob like fashion over a miscommunication. It wasn't. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you can I should get a mob have called coming. you, which I said, you know, um, and and to give be fair to me, like I did genuinely misunderstand you. Like, true, you believe that? Yeah, but that's the problem. Look, faith. I think most right. of this. Look, my definition of cancel culture is people drumming up a mob to cancel somebody over something that didn't actually happen. 
It's basically people s seeing something in the worst possible light and assuming racism, sexism, or homophobia, which is exactly what happened with us when it was not, uh, that's not, that wasn't my intent. That's not what I meant. That's so that that's the problem. I, I hear what you're saying, but we yeah. are public figures and we get criticized for the no, things that we say. You set know? set, so. set yeah, that but, aside, though. It's a miscommunication. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, well I've even, got your number now and I'll call you next time if that happens. But I hear you. Even putting like miscommunications aside, which I do think is a lot of times what happens in these situations. Um, I don't have a problem with people being held accountable for what they're saying. like For I'm, what they actually say, though. Right, right, right. I like. I'm actually completely fine with the students who, you know, wrote that, like, I don't think everyone that's, that was involved with some group, you know, should be held responsible. But for the students that wrote that uh, letter at, I forget where it was, Harvard or Princeton or one of the Ivy League schools, you know, that was basically just blaming Israel for the Hamas attack, like the day after it happened or whatever, you know, and there was a person that had like the billboard with their faces and, you know, some of the companies we're like, you know, tell us who these students are because we don't want to hire them. I'm actually totally fine with that, uh, with that happening there. My issue is when you're talking about like people should be accountable for what they're saying, it's what is the Overton window of acceptable things. Like supporting or defending, you know, Hamas killing 1,400 people, that should not be acceptable, right? But if you have like a disagreement about you know whether trans women should play in cis women sports or you have a disagreement about how like we should deal with crt and systemic racism or you have a disagreement about you know uh george floyd or Auburn, or the Auburn arby case or ahmed arbery case or you have a disagreement about kyle rittenhouse like there's a lot of things that you could have a disagreement on that if you did people would try to get you fired and would very often would get you fired just because companies are so cowardly that they don't actually care if there's a big complaint about something they'll just get rid of it okay but yep. my pushback sitch would be have you heard of this in real life like it's so rare for people to it's like have rare, a conversation right? with somebody in real life and be like oh my god your takes are so shitty i'm gonna now reach out to your work and try to get you fired i mean the brianna that, wait, just said happens all the, the time when it was happening to her I, recently i'm off the internet i'm talking like somebody said something to you in person well, well i don't i don't know if, well okay we're not talking about what happens like two co-workers having a conversation and then i don't know they get first of all i'm sure that does i actually heard lots of ways people say like oh i had a conversation and the person you know rad me out to hr or something so i think that does happen okay number one but number two we were talking about whether you know the problems of being anonymous on the internet so yeah, I'm talking about like if someone says something and someone they either say on the internet or they or someone posts it on the internet and then they get slammed on it on the internet and this does happen all the time. People get dragged yeah, I, all I the do time agree. on the internet. I, I mean, don't it just happen to me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I. Yeah, yeah exactly. you just said at the beginning of this conversation, yeah. people were trying to get I, you fired from your deny Democrat it. gig. I don't deny it. It happens in this environment, in this culture yeah. online. I'm just saying, right. if the online was more like the real world, I think it'd be uh, a, happening much less. That's my point. Maybe yeah, I'm but, living in a fantasy world. Maybe you're I right. Think maybe you every are. time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look, maybe every time someone expresses their support of Kyle Rittenhouse, they're instantly fired from their job. But <laughs> I just, I haven't heard a lot of instances of this, and maybe I'm blind to it. Maybe I'm not looking for it, but yeah. I, I just... I don't hear about this a lot in the real world. I feel like people, when they talk in person, they express things a little more calmly, a little more chill, and and they're a little more understanding of someone having an opinion, unless they just flat out say like a slur. Look, we should we should read some super chats. I want to ask one thing before well, we move well, on to before, super chats. Before we move on, I just there is this tendency for mobs to form. I mean, and we we have seen this offline. I mean, obviously, even before like woke stuff was like a big thing. You know, there was the whole Duke lacrosse scandal, which was just this massive mob forming. And, you know, there was, you know, more recently there was, I forget the guy's name, you know, who was saying like, listen, it was during the BLM stuff, which people like literally lost their minds during the BLM stuff. There was a guy who was like, listen, we should, you know, not be, we should be trying to get people to not riot because if you riot, you know, that will basically let the Republicans win elections. And that guy got fired from his job for saying that. And so I just... You know, I don't think you're taking this seriously if you're just going to like dismiss this as like that's not a thing that happens. 
I'm not well, saying it's not a thing that happens. I'm certainly mm-hmm. not saying that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're it happens, more open but look, to you're, it. You're I think ex- IRI was going to dismiss well, it, but. but I think your example is like going back to like the mid 2000s or whatever when that Duke Well, that was, no, you were asking about something that happened in real life. I mean, obviously there's right. this whole scandal of, you know. Uh, he, dis- he dismisses you know, cancel culture as bad as we dismiss sexism, Sitch. This is like, I, what's going I, on I just, here? I mean, there you go. <laughs> I, my whole argument is I think cancel culture is much less prevalent in the real world than it is on the internet, which obviously goes into the real world too. I get that. But we're but talking, but I know, but we are yeah. talking about whether people should be anonymous on the internet. So like, right. that's what matters, right? <laughs> well, and that's my point is that cancel culture is much less prevalent in real life, like one-on-one in your community, the way people interact. And if I, if the internet was more like that by mm-hmm. losing anonymity on the internet, I feel, and the temperature was brought down online that there would be much less cancel culture. So are you saying if you think that if no one could be anonymous on the internet, that the people mm-hmm. calling for the people to be canceled wouldn't be calling for them to be canceled because they're not anonymous? Is that that would be mean? part of it too? Because there are repercussions for like false yeah. allegations and being hyperbolic and I mean, trying to get someone screwed and having a paper don't, trail. Don't people have motivations to cancel people outside of of them saying bad things. Like if somebody has a, a big platform and people feel they're influential in getting Republicans elected, isn't the, aren't they going to be interested in deplatforming that person regardless of what they say? I mean, they'll be motivated. The question is, will they be successful? My mind goes to Trump right now, where I think one of the reasons Biden is losing in the polls is, uh, you know, I just want to admit, I was one of these people that said over and over, the media should not cover every single stupid statement that Trump makes. We should not like make him the center of every news cycle. I said that a million times uh, from 2016 to 2020. And look at the news cycle now. Trump is saying absolutely unhinged stuff over on, uh, you know, Truth Social that my view is openly fascist, uh, calling for the end of democracy and the political uh, destruction of his enemies. And it's barely in the news. And I was flat out wrong about that. So I think in some cases, I think my view shifted that it's actually important to give those people a mic. Oh, interesting. Well, I'm just saying there are people that do believe they want to take political actors out of, off the field. So yeah. they're motivated to misrepresent what they're saying in order to do that. And I feel like that's primarily What's what cancel culture is. What's an example of that is. happening? I think um, he would say like Trump being removed from the ballot due to the 14th Amendment. Would that be fair, Adam? No. Like look, insurrection? I, no. Wait, I'm sorry, can I, look, you repeat that? I was wrong something. I'm, I'm talking about... Well, look, uh, the Gina Carano is like a perfect example. Like obviously... Neither Sitch nor I believe what she said was anti-Semitic. We pe- we feel people made her out to be anti-Semitic because she was getting political and they wanted to basically deplatform her for her politics. So, but she's, she's a small example. Obviously there are bigger examples like Ben Shapiro is a giant target. They would love to take Ben Shapiro out. So Candace Owens is a, a target. So she says, what is an example? How could we take out Ben Shapiro? I see someone that says some stuff and gets blood. Like, I would actually say that him deliberately provoking the left with uh, outrageous statements is his literal business plan, (laughs) right? Which is why he does this all the time. And as a result of that, Daily Wire is massive. Well, I think that's why you had uh, Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles when they would say they're kind of extreme statements. They kind of use very careful, like vague language that it's like, okay, I sounds to me like he's just, like advocating for white nationalism or he's advocating, you know, that, you know, we should get rid of trans, you know, anyone who's trans or something, but that it's like couched in such a way that people can kind of interpret it one way or the other. Like, like, I don't think they, I think if they explicitly, I think if one of them explicitly called for this, like an extreme position like that there'd be a massive pressure on the Daily Wire to get rid of them. I don't know if they would, but I think it would definitely change the the calculation. Yeah. I mean, do you think that the Daily Wire could hide, that could have someone on staff that's just like an open white nationalist? Do I think so? Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Do you I think mean, people... it'd, be, it'd be interesting. I'm not sure they could. The, the point that I'm making is, and look, you, 
do you feel people are mischaracterizing your positions now? Like what, what, what argument are they making to get you fired at this very moment? So they are trying to, um, despite a literal, like over a decade of strongly advocating for Palestinian people and openly saying that I think Israeli foreign policy is on the wrong track and is leading to humanitarian abuses, a stance, which by the way, did not help my congressional campaign very much when I ran, right? So despite all of that, they're reaching out to back channel contacts. They're saying like, Brianna is Islamophobic. Look at what she's saying here. You oh, okay. Know, okay. So this is, this is, look, stuff. this is right. a perfect example. Okay. Sure. They see you as a, poli well, look, I don't know if they're trying to take you off the field politically because I think they agree with you politically. I mean, they might be trying to take you off the field because they're jealous of your platform and they want to replace you, but they are. I, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you're probably not Islamophobic. No. So that's a lie. They're mischaracterizing you as Islamophobic. It would lead to some trouble working with Cenk if I were. So there we well, go. Well, yes, yes. But th this is the exact point that I'm making. I'm saying I cancel culture for me, I always define it this way. And Sitch doesn't agree with me, but I define it as mischaracterizing someone's position to make them out to be sexist, racist, or homophobic or transphobic, even though they're not and try to get them fired. That's exactly what's happening to you. What, when, when they're actually a racist piece of shit and they should be fired, that's accountability culture. A yeah. lot of, but you know, obviously people do dog whistle and people do say things that, they, you know, it's obvious that they are racist, but there's not enough there to, to convict them on, but what's going on with you it's completely made up it's yeah fictitious i i do think something i would really encourage more people on my own side to develop is a little bit more of a thick skin and ability to have your own people like criticized right um i'll give you a really good example you brought up gina carano well, look that's um, not going to change the fact that people are lying about you sure i 100%. mean you can you can have the thickest skin in the world and if people are lying about you, that's that's not look. I completely acceptable. agree. This is a terrible tactic, and it's the exact same thing Gamergate did. I I am of the opinion that the Gamergate playbook, the progressive movement, has adopted this uh, uh, enthusiastically, and we use this playbook all the time. I think that something we need to do on the left is develop a thicker skin about having you know, sexist jokes or transphobic jokes, right? Like we can't go DEF CON for every single time that this happens. A really good example, Bill Burr has said stuff I find a billion times more objectionable than Gina Carano. And I like his stuff. He's a good uh, comedian, but he's also a Mandalorian. He has made some jokes I think are really just outright sexist, right? But you will never find a tweet of me out there calling for him to be fired from the Mandalorian because it would be beyond out of proportion to the issues at hand. I think that one of the things the progressive movement would be very well to develop is more of a sense of proportionality because I, I just think everything can't be a crisis. Every single statement can't be a moral failure. Every single tweet cannot be the summation of your entire life and your entire viewpoint. This is a crazy way to evaluate people and it's not getting us anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I agree. Look, a thicker skin would be helpful because then they wouldn't see innocuous things as slights and insults. Also, just having a little bit more charity for what people are saying, I think would cause the two parties to kind of meet in the middle because I do think a lot of things are being characterized as transphobia or sexism or homophobia when they aren't intended that way in any way, shape or form. Yeah. So, but, but, okay. okay well, there's super chats to read, Let me but read I just, super chat no, question. I want you to steal, oh, okay. man. Look, I, this <laughs> keeps coming up every time you come on, Brianna, mm -hmm. I feel like you are accusing us of downplaying sexism. Okay. Look, I Ooh. have, I have experienced, look, I, I've experienced sexism myself on the show many times. Um, Sitch has experienced Directed it at you. What do you mean? Sitch has experienced it. We have Sammy G constantly making sexist. <laughs> comics of sitch look i and look i've had i have a lot of um, female friends who've experienced sex you know sexual advances in the workplace that have been uncomfortable that they that is just bullshit they shouldn't have to deal with that nonsense so i mean i i 
I feel like you you think we think sexism is like non-existent or something when that is so far from my position. So I just I want you to steel man our position here. So going forth in the world, you know, if you decide to make a Reddit post later, you <laughs> correctly assess our position. Sure. I think that both of you are generally very suspicious of the way that um movements for equality have been operating, uh, including you know, racial equality, women's equality, trans equality, gay equality. I think that you feel uh, it's you're, anti you're way off. Okay, look, I don't, uh, well, I let don't me finish, condone let any me of this that you're saying. I'm not saying you're, you condone it. I'm saying that you feel that the tactics that are being used are fundamentally dangerous for democracy. And I think it's in this category. No, this is, no of, you're not. You don't okay, know our position. It, Look, please. the whole steel manning a position is I'm, you're supposed to be able to articulate my position so that I would say, yes, that is my position. And I'm everything, trying to do that. Yes. Yeah. But everything you've said is not even close to my position. Like to the okay. point where I have to speak up and say, no, 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 that's not my position. No, no, no. Okay, well, uh, sure. Go ahead. Sure. I think that both Take of you Take two. Think Try again. That, it's a little obnoxious, let's be honest. Uh, I think that well, both look, of you- Well, look, we've had this conference. Look, uh, hold on. I want to diffuse the tension here, okay? There's no tension. I, don't, I just- Well, you, you know, you've said- tension you're, coming from Adam. Look, you're funny. saying- She said I'm being obnoxious. Look, I- You are we, being obnoxious, but you, listen. Why don't you had, state your position, Adam? Yeah. Okay. We, that would be easy. You've yeah. you've been on our stream three, maybe four times. If if you if you've articulated a position to me four times, sure, and I can't articulate that position, I would expect you to be a little disgruntled about it. <laughs> like what? Why wouldn't look? What? Why? Why wouldn't you be disgruntled if I was mischaracterizing your position so badly? I think that there's part of your psychology that it really hurts you when people don't see you the way that you see yourself. I, mm -hmm. I think that's really <laughs> clear to me. And, um, you know, okay. so I think that directionally, if you look at your comments, I think that you truly believe that identity politics and what you call wokeism is illiberal. And mm -hmm. I think that you feel that it is um, driving us towards extremes. And I feel, think that you feel that it is not constructive for the overall dialogue. And it's something you are asking people on the left to have more awareness about. There you go. I like that. That's much, that's pretty accurate. Right? That's your position, Sitch? I mean, that's part of my position. I don't know what the position that we're looking for specifically is because I didn't really hear the question. But... Just your position on, on sexism. Oh, uh, my position on sexism? No, but that's my position overall in terms of like the dangers of wokeness and the liberalism and stuff. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, my position on sexism is sexism is bad, <laughs> and I think I think wokeness, uh, illiberal leftist policies regarding sex, uh, will only make sexism worse. And I think what we're seeing is sort of evidence of that. Look, I think obviously sexism is bad. And if people are being discriminated against, treated unfairly, I think that we should do something about it. I think we should be wary of negative stereotypes. I've said it a thousand times on the show. Sure. I do think we need to understand how bad the sexism is. We have to have an accurate uh, depiction of the world around us that we have to you know, use empiricism science to uh, get to some concrete understanding of the world that's accurate. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear any of that in, in her assessment. And I, what I think you, you think sexism as is at a certain level and you're that we are just supposed to accept that level. And since we aren't accepting that level, we think sexism is non-existent. I think that's what you think our position is, I, even though it's not even that. close to that. I, position. I don't think that. And it, you can go back and rewind the tape. I'm not even sure I used the word sexism. I think that my position is when I'm on the show, I think there is a, a, a tendency to minimize uh, the struggle that marginalized people are going through. And I've said this repeatedly, I don't think it makes you bad people. I think there are any number of people it's, in streaming, on, hold on, on the right and the left 
that also have this. Like, let's be clear, there are not a lot of women in streaming and the most successful ones like Pokemon don't talk about politics. I don't think that's a coincidence. So um, I, I think that when you look at the, 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 the entire tsunami of issues facing America, I think you look at this and, and decide that what you call wokeness is one of the top priorities that you want to focus on professionally. I don't share that assessment. I agree with you. It's a problem. I point out many ways we agree on this show today. I just think that you are overstating the case, and I think you're minimizing some of the reasons that that might be a popular solution. I think the problem. I wouldn't use the word minimize. Yeah, let um, me let me respond. I, I look, th- I, let me I, let I me just, just talk. Let me just talk about this word minimize because I think this could be just a mistake or a miscommunication. Because to me, when I hear minimize. That means that a person agrees or acknowledges something is exists at some level and they're making a conscious decision to not talk about it or to downplay it. That's how I read the word minimize, where I think, you know, for us, we have a disagreement on what the facts are. Yes. And how to solve that problem. So I wouldn't say that we're minimizing it. We just disagree on like the level of sexism that exists. Yes. We would never minimize, uh, this the struggle of oppressed people like it's one of the central things that animates me and i'm sure animates sitch is the struggle people have struggles and we want to fight against those struggles the 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 thing that we're disagreeing on is the facts so you're basically saying we're we're minimizing their plight because you're setting their plight at some level that we don't see tangible evidence of well, so, let me give you a really concrete example here, and maybe this can help. Um, so, uh, Sitch, you sent me a link of the Meta Story study you were mentioning earlier in the in the the, mm-hmm. the show today, uh, and basically, like we saw this on Twitter, and you're like, "Oh my goodness, here it is! Evidence that gender bias is solved." I'm going to bring this up. Funny, hold but... on, hold on. So, and you go and you look at this, and yeah. let's really dig into this. So, mm-hmm. this is by it's a Substack by a psychologist. Uh, I can't, I'm on the show, I'm trying to be present, so I can't really vet him. But this is a Substack by someone who claims to be a Darwinian psychologist that looked at a bunch of studies here. And what is he measuring? As far as I can tell, briefly, like looking at this while the show was going on, mm-hmm. he's looking at hiring, hiring. Right. Hiring. Yeah. Hiring. One of the things that we know over and over and over again is this is true. Women do not face as much uh, bias in the hiring decisions mm. because of things like formal HR practices. I actually said this to you the very first time I came on the show, that one of the ways that structural sexism rears its head in the game industry is the rate at which people are promoted, the resources that you get once you become a parent, because there are so many forces that very subtly show you the door, which is why women leave the game industry at a rate of three times times that of men. So like when I say minimize, I have to like, you know, like seeing this study and going, let's talk about it on the show. It, it just feels like you're reaching for the conclusion you want to believe it. So I agree that like I should have said it was about hiring because right. that, that didn't occur to me because I didn't realize, or I didn't remember that you had a take that we talked about where you're like, oh yeah, hiring is you know, not like an issue, right? So in sure. my mind, I'm just lumping it all together as like one general topic, sure, right? And so, so that's fine. And to say, yeah, okay, this is about hiring. It's not about you know doing raises. It's not about work culture behavior, which I agree. Those are all things that have to be looked at uh, independently because there could right. be different issues there, right? But again, so that's fine. It's a fine. It's a fair, completely fair point to bring up. But I just want to say, like, do you agree that like the term minimize requires intention and i read it as intention to dishonesty no oh god no 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 oh gosh i i would never want to imply that so when i think about minimize i'm specifically thinking about this from my experience with addiction which Mm -hmm. is when you're you know i've been sober for 20 years and one of the things they teach you in rehab is to look at your behavior and kind of 
think through this tendency we all have to like go, this isn't a problem. Maybe I don't need to think about this that much. It's kind of an unconscious process to kind of not face things that are easier to ignore. That's all. Yeah, but Boom. down, okay. down, even using the term downplay mm -hmm. is is talking past the sale. You're basically saying this exists. And you are trying to ignore the fact that it exists when right. we're arguing over whether or not it actually exists. I think the fact that we've discussed this for like so much of the show tonight really indicates how sensitive y'all are about this. It's, yeah, I wonder, it's well, I mean, you're the one that brought it up, you know? so it's probably you're yeah. sensitive about it. No, well, <laughs> you're the one that keeps coming ask, back here, man. <laughs> in the end, Adam, what does it matter if she thinks you're sexist or not? Wait, I don't wait, think he's sexist. I, I know, I'm not say saying that. you do. Wait, yeah. I'm not well, saying it, you it do. matters. Saying, what, just, what would it matter anyways if she did? Wait, wait, wait. Why does it matter if we're sensitive to the topic? Like, why is it a bad thing? Because it what, shuts it, down conversation. It makes well, it no, really but, hard but, to talk about these issues. Well, if, yeah. If, if we're saying that, like, okay, again, and I mean, I don't know, it doesn't seem like usually when, when you know, if you said, listen, such my position is this, and this is, and I don't like this word you're using, I'd be like, okay, I mean, I, that's right. fine, I guess. Like, I just, I don't, I mean, I understand that, you know, in your mind, minimize means something different, but I agree with Adam that I think minimize does have an element of talking past the sale and assuming that the disagreement, that whatever we're disagreeing about, there is some that exists and whether we're intentionally or unconsciously downplaying it, like that's, that's not our position. But this is what's going to happen, y'all, because you've made the editorial decision to focus on this so much in the show. What's going to no, happen? You brought your it audience, up. We did not plan on audience, talking about this. You literally brought this up. We are addressing it because you brought it up. Can't finish what I'm saying, please. Yes, but look, don't don't mischaracterize this as if we are obsessed with it. You brought it up. You cannot you cannot accuse us of things and not expect us to respond. That's just normal, okay? If you make accusations, we're gonna respond. If we make accusations about you, I would expect you to respond. You should respond. This is out of proportion. This is comically ridiculous, man. Okay, so I'm gonna finish what I was saying. What is going to happen? Because you, the show is focused so much on a stray comment that I don't think is unreasonable. I think I've shown evidence of why I believe this. I think it's a reasonable position to have. I've tried to state it in a way that's open. It's not direct. It's not insulting. But because you've focused so much on this, your audience is going to scream at me from the hills. Look, don't, this is, don't hold do on, that. I'm yeah. going to finish. Look, this is you're, why you're, look you're making this is you're why, still making accusations Adam, this is why it is so hard for this topic to be talked about and to be solved because there's a tremendous um resistance to hear any kind of uh voice that's saying this is an issue and it's it just leads it's to so, blowback. It's never so, a good experience. Me, we are not me, resistant at me, all. Um, <laughs> let me interject here. First of all, I want to sure. say everyone, you know, obviously. Yeah, don't attack you know, Brianna. Don't attack obviously. Brianna or leave her any comments. I mean, we say this about everyone. It's completely not conducive to us to be able to talk to people, you know, whatsoever, or to book guests. And I also think it's just an immoral thing to do. You know, you could disagree with someone if you, you know, so they say something and you're just disagreeing with them in some sort of like normal way, but don't, you know, like a tax on. Okay. So that's number one. Uh, but number two, you know, I mean, I agree. And you know, that, uh, you know, Adam is more annoyed by mischaracterizations than I am. We all have the things that bother us and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, like that's fine to, to, to bring that up. And if it doesn't bother you to that extent, that's that's fine. Well, I look, I can mischaracterize wait, 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 but I don't think it's fair, Brianna, to kind of turn this around the way that you're doing, where you're saying like, well, now that we're talking about this, like we're changing, you know, the tone of the show and the subject of the show and leading this thing, because I mean, I, I still haven't not like heard you to even acknowledge the point about just the whole minimizing thing in the in, in something to that effect and just say okay like maybe i won't use that term you know we just disagree about the facts because it still sure. seems like like I, just to me that would just be simple and then the conversation could just like end and we could move on so you want me to say i 
don't think you two have a structural, like a, a kind of tendency to, what is a word I can even say here, downplay uh, like the problems. I want of... you to say that we just disagree on the level of sexism that exists in society. I don't know that we do. That's okay. Well, then I guess we, okay. Then I don't understand. That's 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 the hang up. You understand? That's the hang up. Okay. Same thing I said at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Say it again. Okay. I think that a criticism I would have for your analysis, the lens yeah. at which you view the world, is I think you structurally and consistently downplay the the impact that structural sexism, structural racism. And uh, you know, structural transphobia. I think you tend to downplay these effects. And I think that you tend to believe that the solution, the medicine is worse than the cure. Okay, you're just completely straw manning. You're completely straw manning our position. This is the whole reason why we wanted to right. do the thing. Okay. But it, look, you, you're it just. I want to make it clear. You, it, honestly, you are, yeah, yeah, but you are incapable of articulating our position. Okay. Or that's just, just the fact. No, I'm not. It's, Sitch just said it, was, it summarized how he felt. You're not telling well, the Well, no, no, no. That What you just said now does not summarize what I feel. Um, you said earlier, you said yeah, but that, that was about general captures part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that is part of it, yeah. But I mean, we don't, again, we just, we don't agree on the level of sexism. That is our opinion. I mean, I don't know. If, okay. if you don't believe us, that's fine. We can move on. I'm just saying that's that's our thing. Okay. So, um. Because I want to move on. And read yeah, let's read too. some. It's let's read bad. some super chats. Okay. Uh, J Mac, our circuit father. Thanks so much for the very generous three hundred dollars. Thank you, Jesus. Damn. Says, uh, wow. we need to, I know. J Mac is our executive producer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he says we need to establish terms here. Uh, when Brianna Wu says white nationalism, what does she mean? Shapiro said time and time again that someone with those views would not be welcomed as a host because it goes beyond the pale. You're trying to have a conversation, but I can't take it seriously uh, if you believe that Ben Shapiro. If she would allow truly that. believes this, yeah. yeah. If I truly believe, can you repeat that last part? That Ben Shapiro would allow like a white nationalist on the Daily Wire. I guess I would probably admit I don't read enough Daily Wire to have strong views about that, mm -hmm. but. It seems to me that a lot of Republican media outlets do tend to air voices that are increasingly friendly towards white nationalism. So uh, maybe maybe Daily Wire is not one of them, but um, I think maybe you can't see it in your own party. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, Cameraman 502 says the left and the Democratic Party are only about five years behind the Republican and the right. I would hope this has been shown in the last few weeks. How do you guys yeah. feel about that? I, I kind of agree. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. How do you feel about this that? This is why I'm saying like we got to call it out to some extent. I agree. I agree. Behind on what? Call, calling out extreme elements within our party? Well, do you think that the left and the Democratic Party are only about five years behind the Republican and the right in terms of like ex like becoming extreme or whatever? Oh, no, I, I don't think that this is an indicator of what's to come. I, I really disagree on that point in general. I, I think this is a blip. I think these people will forget about this Israel issue in four weeks and they'll move on to the next thing. But it, it won't. But isn't that a problem? As, isn't that a bad thing? It's not. a. I don't think it's a problem on the left, which probably a lot of people disagree with. But I, I don't think that hmm. this extremism element is a problem on the left. I think it's more, like I said, more about people getting their news from TikTok and, and other things like that. Okay. I mean, I guess, yeah, I'll just say without rehashing, because we talked about this earlier. Yeah, that's our, I mean, that's our primary disagreement is that I think that the attitude that leads people to have this position on Israel uh, is going to lead them to have and has led them to have other bad positions on other things. I don't think it's like a one off. But. Fair. I just don't think that it, it's going to have as much of an impact on our politics as well. I mean, you look at Tuesday's results from last week. Israel didn't have any impact on uh, Democrats winning and our policies advancing. Sure. Well, well, not specifically. I, I don't disagree. Uh, Jonathan Rosler says, I might be misremembering, but wasn't Zionism considered to be an anti-Jewish conspiracy theory like 10 years ago? Uh, I mean, I guess it depends how you define Zionism, right? Because I mean, Zionism right. on its own is just that you believe there should be a Jewish state, right? Right. That's how I see it. I look back to, you know, 
Herzl back in the founding of Israel and all that and the reason behind Israel. And I, I look more to that. I, I don't believe in like forever expanding Israel or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Roman six says it's just this quote. It's just this one issue sounds off awfully like I don't like this one because it makes my side look bad. The same principles that are driving this one issue drove most of the other issues Sitch and Adam mentioned. Yeah, which we've talked about you disagree with. But. Uh, Ghost Dong says, for Brianna, woo, terrible plot aside, what are your thoughts on third birthday's gameplay in oh PE1 and PE2? I love this game. I listen to the soundtrack all the time. I've beaten it so many times. Uh, yes, the plot is terrible, but I love this game. Third birthday? I haven't even heard of this. It's uh it's the third uh sequel to Parasite Eve and Oh okay. Oh gotcha. boy, it is. Uh so if you look over here, you can see my original Parasite Eve poster uh from Japan <laughs> which right. cost me an absurd amount of money. Uh I love that game a lot. Okay, there you go. Um let's see. Toxic mix for $50. Thank you so much. It says while the effort to call out problems on your own side is commendable, um, when that is immediately followed up with something, something, the right though, you lose me. Is there a real problem or are you just concerned with it being used against you? Well, me, I have not brought up, at least I don't think I brought up tonight. And I don't think I've done in general on this topic, for example, but the rights doing this, that's so much worse. I, mm -hmm. I have not even engaged in that on the Israel topic. I've been happy to call out the bad actors on our side and the thinly veiled anti-Semitism. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I called out Jamal Bowman, democratic lawmaker for his bullshit about Israel launching a missile that killed somebody near a press tent and he didn't, he had to delete it because it could have been a Hamas commander for all we know. Right. I called out Rashida Tlaib for her bullshit on from the river to the sea. Give me a break. And uh, I did not say, but on the other hand, look at these Republicans. Right. I think, um, when it comes to sort of like saying like i think the problem is if if it's only if it's used as like a whataboutism if it's like oh yeah that's bad but the republicans did a bad thing too i think that's the mm -hmm. problem uh sure. oftentimes i notice that people confuse that with if you're if you're trying to like give a little bit a spoonful of medicine to your side you got to put a little bit of sugar in it right so you could say like oh yeah like you know my team who's primarily left like we're doing something wrong. Don't worry. The right's also doing something wrong too. Here's a little bit of sugar to put in the medicine, but you know, we shouldn't stray <laughs> down that path. Right. So, you know, I think that's, that's appropriate exactly for using what's in happening. That context. So. Can we, uh, I don't mean to derail the show, but can we talk about from the river to the sea really quickly? Sure, because sure. I'm really upset about this. Um, I don't, you know, IRI, I don't mean to speak for you, but what I don't understand is it seems to me I have updated my language so many times over my life because groups of people have told me that this is offensive to them or it's not something they want me to say, right? Like it used to be you couldn't say fat and then you're supposed to say person of size and then the fat community reclaimed it and you're supposed to call them fat again. Like really, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I yeah, missed that one. As I understand it, this is correct. And I do my best genuinely. Hilarious. No snark. It is my my always attempt to talk to people with respect. What I don't understand about the left right now is I, I hear and I understand the academic argument for from the river to the sea. I understand this, but it seems to me every single Jewish person I personally know and am friends with is telling me, Brie, this really seems like it's invoking the Holocaust and it makes me uncomfortable. And I don't understand why Jewish people are the ones that have to sit down and, and take it and, and feel like dehumanized or not valued because we can't cure them on this one thing. Like a slogan that's obviously like obviously a little bit edgy right? Right, right um i i don't understand why we can't show jewish people the same respect we we tend to show everyone else it does not make sense to me well didn't you listen to hassan he told you the answer to this question right of course because uh the jews are more privileged and powerful than the palestinians so they get the pound sand 
Yeah, I, I agree, Brianna. I thought we listened to the group that's harmed by the messaging and right. how to use the messaging. And if somebody claims, hey, this is very offensive and harmful, I thought we on the left especially care about that. And that's who we listen to. But not mm -hmm. when it comes to Jews, I guess. And that's basically where I start to say, hey, we got some anti-Semitism problems here. Well, not, not, not when you, it comes I... to oppressors, though. That's the lens. Is the only, it's not the Jewish thing. It's the oppressor thing. I couldn't agree more. Can I be honest with you, IRI? Mm -hmm. Five years ago, when Jewish people said stuff like that, I secretly in the back of my mind thought, that's a little hyperbolic, but you know, <laughs> I'll go with it. And I see it now. And I'm like, yeah, I really agree with that. Like we tend mm -hmm. to, everyone else gets it except with the Jews. And I, I think you're right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I used to not talk about Jewish being Jewish as a marginalized group because I thought we're the least oppressed group out of everybody, you know. But nowadays, uh, we're under grave threat. I mean, it's dangerous out there for Jewish people. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's time to speak up and start pushing back. Uh, well, but I agree I, with well, you. Just, yeah. it, it, hmm? it depends. What do you think? On, it Look, I just I don't. It's the lens is the problem. I just it's the lens the is the oppressing. problem. Yeah, because yeah. you're saying look. You, you basically just said, look, I didn't think we were oppressed, but now I do think we're oppressed. No, no, no. I, I Maybe I, that's how it came off. But I've always thought Jewish people are not oppressed, but a marginalized group. And, and there is um, we on the on the Sunday show, we listened to Hassan and Ethan fighting about this. And Hassan mm -hmm. understands this oppressor oppressed dynamic so much. Ethan comes out and he says, listen, we, he, he basically gave the same speech that Brianna just gave. He said, look on the left, we've always looked at, at marginalized people. And we've said, you know, we should take their feelings into account. And, and if they ask us to change our language, we're going to change it. Right. And he, he tells us to Hassan and he says, look, I'm, I'm Jewish. There's anti-Semitism is on the rise. I'm asking you to change your language. Why can't you change your language? And Hassan says, because you're the oppressor in this situation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I just think um, he's twisted himself into a press soul to try to justify the actions here. But it, and is the lens, is the lens, could we live well, without this lens? Okay. Is the lens totally necessary? Well, I mean, it, it is obviously if we're in a situation where people are, literally oppressed or oppressed but well my is that the situation be, this is the only instance i've ever seen of this oppressor being idea being brought up and and it just happens to be with jewish people so that's well, what no, where i start to get bothered with, with white people no no i know in general it gets brought up but i'm just saying right now like hassan i don't think hassan would say that about trans people like if or anything like a, it's just when it comes to Jewish people, for some reason, he's got this this strange idea that he's going to have to justify anything against them. Well, I, I think he brought it up. I'm 100 percent on this, but I'm pr I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there was the whole cracker discourse about whether it was OK to call white people crackers. Sure. And that, that was another common argument was, well, white people are not oppressed. So therefore you can be racist against them. I mean, that's literally, you know, power plus privilege equals racism, you know, kind of trying to rebrand racism that way under that theory. Right. And I, I understood the argument there with white versus everyone else, but um, I, I don't think that they're like white people are a marginalized group. And I know that's going to hit a hornet's nest in your, in your chat, but no, I just, no, I, no white people are marginalized. There's no <laughs> saying marginalized people don't. He's saying it's a group. But see, but that's my, my problem. That's is like, the problem. Sitch. The, the problem. I know. I'm saying uh -huh. the problem is is like there. Sh that idea shouldn't even really be exist an idea. Yeah. Because I. You sure. Do you okay? Do you agree with it? Well, I think it's 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 hard to see things through someone else's shoes if you're not part of that group. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, but I'm saying like there's there's no. It doesn't seem like it makes sense that there should be a lens in which racism is basically allowed as long like publicly allowed as long as it's the majority group that but doesn't not, seem to make sense to me it's not it's totally allowed hassan really? was suspended from the platform for using that term which i found no, ridiculous he, he was but it was I thought he was suspended for doing something else no and he it, was suspended look at for saying no... like, calling someone a cracker look he, oh, there's no right, there is no don't use the c word you'll get this right. well, I, no 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 but like like you i assume you agree that like uh being racist against white people 
far more allowed than anything. Yeah, there's I mean, no there social the, prohibition the on York that. Times, you can go on Twitter right well, now and say whatever you want. Yeah, the, the New York Times lady, you know, was saying very anti-white things and they didn't fire her for that. They ended up firing her later for something completely different. There was an incident that we covered um, a couple years ago, which was, I don't know if you remember, you know, Nick Cannon uh, was talking to someone from Public Enemy and they had this very long podcast. And in through it, he kind of goes through the whole... I don't know how much you know about like the Nation of Islam uh, founding myth about like Yakub and how white people were genetically engineered to be evil and all this stuff. It's like this like crazy like uh, conspiracy theory about history. And they're kind of going through all this stuff. And the thing that kind of really struck me listening to this that annoyed me as a white Jew is that all the media did when they covered that story was criticized Nick Cannon for anti-Semitism and criticized the podcast for anti-Semitism. I didn't see a single article criticize him for just how racist against white people everything they were saying was. Yeah. Well, look, I don't think racism is acceptable in any capacity. Uh, my argument previously with like the Scott Adams stuff, not to rehash that, but mm -hmm. that's the most recent one that we had or a discussion on it, was it's not as prevalent it's it doesn't seem to be uh, have as much of an impact on society um now we could debate that of course but that's pretty much where i'm coming from but oh, okay. in general i don't think racism is acceptable on in any capacity okay good well good. i just want to go back to from the river to the sea thing real quick um because mm -hmm. it's kind of a sort of the sidetrack um because yeah obviously you know the thing that annoys me is that when i hear people talk about this i just feel like um it's not like a it's not an intelligent conversation because number one Obviously, if it wasn't about getting rid of Israel, the phrase would be, you know, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestinians would be free, not Palestine, the country. Like, and the fact that that linguistic distinction exists should tell you something about what the phrase is calling for, number one. And then number two, it annoys me because there's like this hiding where, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who use the phrase, especially in Western countries, who don't mean it to mean like to genocide Jews or whatever, but that's kind of irrelevant um, whether they mean it that way or not. If that's the origin of the phrase and that's kind of what the literal interpretation of the phrase means, you know, just because other people use it in some way that's like more innocuous, why should that provide cover for using this phrase in the first place? Yeah, it to me it comes down to how do the majority of people perceive that phrase? Like, how do they take it? And is it worth fighting? Is it worth dying on that hill? I don't understand mm -hmm. why these people are dying on the hill. Like, just accept that a lot of people don't like it and say free Palestine, but they refuse. And and well, I don't know what's behind mm -hmm. that except for just a, a hatred of Jewish people. I don't know how else to put it. it it's like I, I do, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I'll just say it's like defund the police. It's because there are these phrases that mean something to the extremists that create them and then they try to trick a bunch of normies into repeating them and that's why they'll never get rid of it because there are the there are a lot of bad actors who do mean the phrase in the most extreme sense and they'll fight to protect it yeah i think that's well said a fan sent mm -hmm. us the original arabic and and the original arabic means from water to water palestine will be arab which right, has a completely different context, different context. yeah, yeah. It, it's well, and, just I don't know how any plain reading of this does not sound like it's invoking yes. <laughs> just right. a plain reading of the phrase. And look, Jenk has called our inside out about this, right? Where there's something about the left where we enjoy taking the edgiest, most unappealing phrases possible, like defund the police and just daring daring any of those moral monsters to disagree with us because we'll let you know just how stupid you are in the smuggest way possible we do that i 100 percent agree that we do that and you know it's not productive here i just think like listen to the phrase how it sounds think about the holocaust and then maybe workshop it some you know like free palestine that's fine i've got no issue yeah. with that same yeah but you're appealing to uh, like your intuitions which i agree with but if they disagree with it they're not gonna they're just gonna dismiss you that's right. kind of the problem with the conversation so we gotta wrap and, things and up so yeah okay anyway but but um, if you want to say if you have a final thought mr important i don't want to cut you off um yeah final thought is it just seems like it's a distraction from their real cause and i just don't get why they continue to go down that road 
Right. Uh, Eric C says, I appreciated Brianna on Leo Laporte's show and glad to see her on here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, I appreciate it. I really, you know, Adam, it hurts me so much when we don't get along <laughs> or have conflict. It really what, what? does. I really, I really <laughs> like you. I consider what you, you a friend and I I hate to have conflict with what's you. A, what's the I mean, I don't, what's the big deal? Like we have, we have to argue it out. The reason why we like building relationships with people is so that we can be a little more forceful with our opinions. I get it. I, Look, I mm. you're, you're wrong. Okay. Look, sooner or later, <laughs> you're going to come I, to that realization. It's not going to be on the go. show. You're going to be sitting at home. You're going to be thinking, ah, that's what he means. There you go. It's, it's, it's not something I think is a unique thing that you're dealing with. I could name you people all across the streaming space that I believe have the same tendency. And it's, it's, you know, if I'm phrasing stuff in a way that is, feels disrespectful to you, that hurts me. It's truly not my intent. I'm, I'm trying to use my free speech and tell you what my perspective is as someone that has dealt with these forces for my entire career. And I'm right. in my forties now. No, I, I understand that. Look, I don't want to read. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark Twain's revenge says question for the guests. What is your opinion on Islam and its integration viability with Western culture? Do you believe Muslims should be allowed to emulate Muhammad and follow his teachings? Or do you believe Islam needs a substantial reform? Oh boy. It's a big question. I'm completely unqualified to have any opinion <laughs> on that whatsoever. Um, I, I don't. I, you don't you it feels like a bit of a trap with the Muhammad reference there to yeah. like some some specific things that Muhammad is referenced to doing. That being said, I, I think um, we can live in a world where Islam is fully integrated and it is in many parts of the world. And I think it, uh, like any religion, it can be modernized and grow mm -hmm. with the people and the times. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know the specifics about Islam to, to say, but I think any religion, well, not maybe not any religion, but I think, obviously, there's a lot of people that do it. I think you can reform most religions to exist in a liberal society, and there needs to be that uh, reformation process and that assimilation process. And I think some countries have done a very poor job assimilating uh, you know, immigrants and immigrant populations. And they just kind of just like this idea that, oh, people just come to your country and they'll just magically assimilate when that's really not the case, if there's, especially if there's not an effort to do so. So. Couldn't agree more. Uh, J Mac says, Brianna Wu doesn't know Sitch's take on chopsticks. <laughs> what is your take on chopsticks? Chopsticks are terrible. terrible. They should be oh, destroyed. No, his, his take is terrible. Your take these is are, terrible. These are sticks. We, listen, we live in modern times. Okay. We have these things called utensils made mm -hmm. out of metal. We don't need wooden sticks like we're no. cavemen, all right? No, no, this is exactly <laughs> like a manual transmission car. So y'all know I love <laughs> classic Porsches. Yes. There is something like a classic oh experience God. friction. There is. Uh, yeah. Friction in an experience oh increases the pleasure of an experience when oh, okay. we all that, i mean listen, i don't mean it true. like that i mean that's friction true. as far as oh i see what you, yeah. as, as what i mean like that is true i mean here's, a, here's a good correct. example Here, uh, so i have a leica camera i just got the leica mm -hmm. q3 this is a camera you have to slow yeah. down you have to manually focus it oh, yeah i can oh, take God. a picture that's great on my iphone but slowing down, thinking about my ISO, thinking about all these things makes that experience mean more to me. It's the exact same thing with chopsticks. <laughs> well, as long as you're acknowledging that chopsticks are a hassle and like it adds. Oh, extra they're, work. they're obviously inferior, but it's a tactile <laughs> experience. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Dr. Diller says, IRI, would you have the same charity if righties ignored the alt-right and rally the troops, or do they have a responsibility to disavow vocal crazies? What What was the first part? It kind of melded together. Would you have the same charity if righties ignored the alt-right and rallied mm. the troops, or do they have a responsibility to disavow vocal crazies? Um, I, I just think... Um... Look, you, you can spend some time on calling out bad actors, but the majority of your time should be spent on standing up for what you believe in and uh, not trying to 
to scold those. I just think that you drown their voice out as you grow. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, I think you should always call out terrible things. That's why I stepped up when I saw, okay, there's some anti-Semitism here, but um, there just happens to be a lot more hateful people on the right, man. I know, I'm sorry. I know you guys, maybe not, you, people disagree, but you know, it's like the the saying. You, you think even after this, you'd say there's more hateful people on the right? Yeah, the I, I still, I think this is a, a minority. I know people will disagree right. with me, but I, I think that um, I this agree. is a very, very vocal minority. I mean, we had 100,000 mm. people in D.C. today for Israel. These people couldn't muster up a crowd like that in America. Okay. Uh, Rosie McRose has two questions. They said, number one, what are the chances we can get Brianna on EFAP? I want to see her interact with rags. I don't know what that is. Uh, there's a show, Every Frame of Pause, uh, Mahler, Rags, and Fringy. They do a lot of like media content. You know how like we'll watch like a video and pause it every two seconds to comment on it. They do that with like media videos. I invited uh, Brianna on the 300 show when Mahler, Rags, and Fringy. I'm were so on. sorry I couldn't be yeah. there. That's okay. Well, look, you were doing a debate against John Doyle, right? That's you right. Out of town. Yeah. That's exactly oh, it. Oh, was that at the modern day debate thing? No, it was a different thing. No, no oh, it was, uh, oh, it was uh, America Uncensored. Oh, okay. But I mean, we've done 500 episodes on Mist on Rockets. I know just how hard it is to produce 300 episodes of a show. You should be very proud of that. Thank you. Uh, Rosie also, McRose says, uh, ask Brianna about the backlash and harassment sex positive feminists like Liana Kersner Kersn got during Gamergate for criticizing how sex negative feminist frequency was. I, I think it's fair criticism. Uh, you know, I, it's been 10 years, so I can say this. Uh, there was a lot of discussions behind the scenes with Anita about the sex negative takes, and uh, it's not my view. Why don't really? you get us Anita no, Sarkeesian on no. the show, Brianna? That'd be, that's an interesting. You know, she has really taken a step back from public life, and <laughs> I understand why. So, Look, we'll be nice. You, you can come on and we, we'll look, hang we'll out. Be, we'll have a good we'll time. Be perf we'll yeah. be perfect uh -huh. angels. Uh huh. Oh, if you don't like the way I say stuff, you're really not going <laughs> to like the way she says it. It'll be fun. Look, I'm sure the, look, our fans would love it. <laughs> you came yeah. on. What's, look, we're, we, we have had some contentious dialogues, but I think it's all in, in good fun. Mm -hmm. Your, your fans have been pretty mean to me. I have to say. Well, guys, knock nice it off guys. Why are you, <laughs> why are you doing that? We're all friends here. Yeah. I, I do. I genuinely do consider both of you friends. I do genuinely like both of you. And you. if you were in jail, you called me up. You said, Brianna, please don't bail me out. I would <laughs> put my own money. Wow, really? Wow. 100%. Okay. I mean, listen, I don't Sitch know if I'd bail you jail, I'm, a, I'm a good boy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Okay, let's say you're stranded at the airport in Boston. I would mm -hmm. drive to Boston and let y'all crash at my house. Wow. You wow. Know, listen, no one... You guys got to be nice. I wouldn't to even let. Okay. I wouldn't even do that for six. I know. Let's what she's do you do? A <laughs> far kinder soul than either me or Adam. So you guys need to be nice to her, right? That's that's impressive. Yes. Uh, PC says CVS stores uh, their margins are five percent, but they get eighty percent from the pharmacy. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Okay. So I guess it's all from the pharmacy then. Um. Let's see. Uh, CT, our editor, for $5 says, I know someone personally who was jokingly flirting with his male friends at work and a third party went to HR and they were fired, even though their friend defended them. Jeez. Wow. Well, speaking of CT, can you guys say, clip it, CT? Can you just say that <laughs> phrase for us? Hold on, hold on. You got to tell which one to go first. Brianna, do you want to do it first? Is it is it To possible? say that? Clip, yeah, say, yeah. clip it, it, CT? Yeah, clip it, clip CT. Clip it, CT. It was hit like excited. Clip it, CT. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> so, so on the show when we when we do a clip or something or we say something that's based and awesome, a lot of times people say clip it, CT. So she's there collecting it. Yeah, yeah. We want like all the guests to say it. But Anna, Anna, when Anna was on the three hundred show, she said it just unprompted, <laughs> and I think it really shocked everyone. I, oh Anna's like a super fan of the show. Not many people. Yeah. Lady, that's cool. That. Yeah. Uh, IRI, can we get a clip it CT? Yeah. Clip it CT. Thank you. Oh, look at that with a point. Thank you. Uh, oh, and yeah. So I'm, I saw you had a conversation with Dev recently, Brown. Yeah. Go well? It was a really good time. 
Good. That was on Wick's show, right? It was on Wick's show. Uh, yeah, Dev is someone who, again, uh, I know it's going to piss people off. I like Dev a lot. Uh, we disagree mm-hmm. on a lot of things, uh, but I think his positions are well thought through. Um, I think uh, where's the I, I just like him <laughs> as a person. I like him as a person. I think he has the same like. I think it's the same tendency that y'all do to a certain extent. So mm-hmm. uh, that's where I disagree. But mm-hmm. there it is. I mean, you shouldn't like Dev because he's an awful person. But He's not an awful person. <laughs> he loves his girlfriend a lot. And uh, I, I think mean, he's a very genuine Hitler person. loves his girlfriend, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's very sweet with Naomi. Really I know. I like that. warms my heart. I'm he's just, a good person. Look, there's no him. but. There was no but. That was right. awesome. Uh, there's a question. Was it as contentious as this conversation? No, not even remotely. Really? Wow. Boring. Three Don't hours be a pussy. of friendly chat. Boring. Oh, Boring. Dev. You got to up your game, man. Yeah. What are you doing? Uh, there's an accusation about uh, a Steam account that you were logged into. Do you know what that's oh, about? Oh, God. Have we not addressed this a million times? I'm going to say this. Look, I'm looking at the camera right now. Yeah. Y'all, you're reading the worst possible thing into something. You're completely making up a lie about me. The mm-hmm. lie that's been going around for 10 years is that Brianna Wu harassed herself. She didn't realize that she was logged into Steam under her own account and made a harassing post. I didn't need to make harassing posts about myself. What happened is my game was on Steam and Gamergate and 4chan were avalanching the launch page and making it impossible for me to talk to any of the shit my team had spent a year working on. Improved lighting, improved frame rate, new scenes, all new costumes, like higher res textures, all this stuff. I can't talk about any of it because everything in the forums is Gamergate, 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 Gamergate. So I tried to make one thing that's going to be at the top of it because the actual game creator is saying it and I make a forum post and it's called is Brianna Wu head of development at GSX and a horrible person and then I go knock yourself out and then I went and made a second post talking about the new features of my game and everyone interpreted this sarcastic post as mm. me somehow harassing myself I'm so sick of this fucking lie it is nothing but a lie. And oh, it gets me so angry. There you go. Cancel culture. Yeah. It, it's people that want to believe the worst thing about someone. If you mm-hmm. look at it, it is so obviously sarcastic. Anyone that knows me knows that that's my voice. And another thing, I don't have alts. I don't have one alt. The closest thing I have to an alt is the Twitter account for my show, Rocket. I don't use sock puppets because I enjoy interacting with the world as myself. And I really take offense that people think I'm like harassing myself. I don't have to. I just look at the comments of this show. It will be there. <laughs> you know, I so I, I brought up the screenshot and you're right. And I never noticed this because it says, yeah, as, you, as it actually makes sense what you're saying. Because it says, yeah. as GSX head of development and noted feminist brown and woo terrible person. And then under it, is a subtext that says eight chan gamergate and kataku in action knock yourselves out yeah yeah so okay i mean that makes sense so it was a deliberate post you made yeah it was to say like you guys want to talk about this you know talk about it here it wasn't here, like you talk about it in one thread instead right. of every it, thread right it's been characterized like you were trying to make it seem like someone else was creating the oh my thread. god yeah. it's right. such a lie okay that makes sense there you go well there you go guys Put the rumor to rest. I mean, it probably won't, but you know, <laughs> uh, what can you do? Uh, Dr. You can't. Dillard, it's I the storyline gets out there and it's been going for a decade and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, Dr. Diller says, I think IRI is on the verge of understanding, but his moral intuition is that people would only do things like theft if they were forced to. I'm reading the narrow corridor now and combined with the righteous mind. It makes it really hard to square the idea that people are naturally good. Evidence seems to be mounting that society tames us, which is probably too pessimistic for people like IRI to accept. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'm guilty of believing in my fellow man then, because I (laughs) I just don't think people will steal if they have no reason to. I don't think people steal for fun or because of a lack of discipline. Um, 
I've walked by bikes standing in the in the park before that nobody was around. Um, I've walked by things that fell on the ground and I'm like, I'm not going to pick that up. It's not mine and I don't want it. So well, maybe I'm a dreamer and maybe I, maybe I'm guilty of that. Yeah, but you have been raised with a set of moral principles that would lead you to act in that way, right? Like you don't think people, I mean, I guess the question is, do you think people are born morally pure and good and society corrupts them? Or do you think people are born like selfish animals and society tames them? Well, I I think that people are born pure in the sense that they, they learn as they go, right? Like little kids will do mean things to each other and then they'll be corrected and they won't do it anymore. So I don't think like if you just grew up without any discipline or direction that you would be perfect. But mm-hmm. um, I, I feel like most people grow up in a, in a, in a decent way. I feel like, I just feel like most people are decent. Uh, I don't know. It sounds like a very pessimistic view of the world from that guy who super chatted that. I don't know. It's kind of depressing. I mean, just, 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 yeah. okay. So let me play devil's advocate. Okay, here. If it. you look at the standard of living, even since the 1950s in the United States, the level of material things that we have access to is through the charts. Uh, you know, my grandfather, uh, when he was serving in World War II, he would tell stories about people on his uh, in his hometown in Mississippi that uh, went and volunteered to go fight in World War II because uh, it's not that they had uh, actual meat for lunch every day. They had it twice a day. Holy moly. So you look at the degree to which our like material standards have risen over just the last you know, 50, 60, 70 years, but the level of crime has, you know, it's gone up and down, but there's there's certainly consistent crime. I think that is strong evidence that there's not a theoretical future that we can go to where crime is going to disappear. I think there are other things that are causing crime. Okay. I mean, I don't think crime is ever going to like disappear, right? Right. Um, but obviously, there are reasons for why it goes up and down. Um, but kind of going back to the the question, the, the original question, you know, you know, it seems to me that the moral intuition for people on the left generally is uh, that people are born pure and good, and that when they act poorly, it's because society has foisted something bad upon them. And people on the right have the exact opposite intuition, that they think people are born selfish and sinful, and that society, if it's a just or moral society, will foist upon them some sort of moral set of principles that they kind of interact with. And I think that this worldview difference is kind of what leads a lot of the disagreement on the left and the right when it comes to dealing with crime and things of that nature. Yeah, Um, people are born civilized instead of being I, civilized I, just, I mean for example like kids kids are not racist by their nature I, I don't think maybe people disagree but i mean you put a bunch of little kids in a room and they're not going to point mm-hmm. out like that they're not going to hate each other for being different they are tribal though tribal but not based on their characteristics yeah but like, like the software or i'd say the hardware for children is to be incredibly tribal racism is a type of tribalism and then I think it's very easy for someone like I think if you have a bunch of kids in a room and say like there's a white kid uh, who picks on like a black kid. Right. And the black kid, you know, doesn't and it's like they're like three or something and say like this is like the only experience that the black kid has experienced with a white kid. I think naturally their mind will be like, oh, white kids are like bad. Like that's the natural <laughs> human like like idea to extrapolate from that. And you have to kind of teach people like, no, just because one person who had some trait did something you doesn't mean everyone that shares that trait did something to you i mean i got bit by a dog when i was a little kid and i didn't think all dogs are bad so i i don't know yeah i'm sure you had positive experiences with dogs at the same time not really when i grew up with dogs okay. like chase you around the backyard and stuff well listen maybe you're just yeah, maybe one of those you, special people <laughs> maybe the tribalism maybe. is broken and, and... yeah maybe you're just you, you don't have that tribal mechanism well, in your brain which is I mean, I, people don't Again, I just think it's a depressing view of the world that we're born as like wild, just angry animals and we need to be like civilized, sculpted and to to be civilized. Like, I I just have more faith in humanity, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I mean, okay, it's just it. it, You know, what was the name of the experiment, Adam, with the uh, the blue eyes and the brown eyes? No, 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 not that one. Well, that is one of them. But the robber's cave. Yeah, the, the kids. 
they yeah. would get these two groups of kids to basically create tribes, even yeah. though they never met the other group of kids, and they would get them to like trash other groups, you know, stuff. And I mean, it seems to me like me and Adam generally look at things from an evolutionary perspective, and it just makes too much sense and definitely seems to be hardwired into us to create little tribes from a, like a hunter gatherer perspective for our own Well, this survival. is why people enjoy politics because it's this is why yes. people enjoy sports. Yes. It allows them to feel those good tribal feelings in a safe and productive way. Well, right. uh, is it productive? Right. <laughs> Sometimes maybe not. Maybe not but productive, but depends. Anyway. So was there anything uh, anything else, Adam? No. Do you thanks for coming on, guys. Do you want yeah. any like final thoughts or did we miss Oh anything? wait, one final question. Uh Soldo says, Where does IRI think racism comes from? Well, I, I think racism comes from ignorance, number one, um, not having experience with people that are different than you. And so you generalize. I think that perhaps you see some negative things like on the Internet and you therefore generalize. And I think it comes from a place of hurt as well, that something's wrong in your life and you're looking for someone to blame. And it's an easy answer to a problem. It's a boogeyman. And so... Mm -hmm. My ultimate answer is it comes from pain within. You basically laid out the same scenario that Sitch did with the three-year-old black kid that was harassed by the three-year-old white kid and had no experience with white well, people but I would, being nice. I would go further. I'd say that kid would not become racist if his life wasn't messed up. If that kid had a great life and loving parents and he was kicking ass, then he probably wouldn't be like, damn, fuck white people. He'd be like, okay, right. that was a little dickhead, and but my life's chill. So that's why I'm so all about improving people's lives, because I feel if your life is good, there's less room for hatred to creep in. Well, you, I just bring it up because you said people who don't have experience, like good, positive mm -hmm. experiences with people of other races, which right, I, I mean, but, I agree to some extent. But you also have to have a bad life, too something right. hurt something wrong i'd never met a racist person that's like happy-go-lucky and like kicking ass at life i'm never i I've, I've, I've met uh, some i know. have yeah i was gonna say yeah. like really yeah i always yeah. see a pain i always feel, feel a hurt inside them even if even if they're like successful in life i still see like a damaged child within i don't know yeah I, that's I, not my assessment at all <laughs> yeah i think like the damage you're talking about is what like how someone would manifest their racism or their bigotry in in a destructive way or like a tear down society way where if they mm -hmm. haven't had that pain and they're just successful i mean they'll still be racist or sexist but it just might not you know they just don't care about like bringing it up or tearing down society because they don't need to well then how i would think they humans have been slaughtering it? each other for resources uh since time immemorial and i think it's very much in our nature to have in groups and out groups and uh you know uh, sometimes it's at the nation level. Uh, sometimes it's at the regional level. A really good example is the uh, the chants I heard growing up of uh, uh, go to hell Yankees, like talking about people that lived up north, which is this very amorphous evil thing. Say Yankees or Yankees? In Mississippi. Yankees. Uh, Yankees. Oh, Yankees. Yeah. Damn Yankees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think is there a nature to be tribal, but I also think we can get over that programming. So um, I think that uh, I think it takes work. I think national unity takes work. And uh, I think um, I think it's really important for a society to have messages baked into it that bring people together and remind them of a common mission. And I think that's something we're very much missing in America. There you go. Beautiful. Uh, name and loss. For two euro says much respect for Brianna. Well, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks. Yeah, no and worries. Thank you, Thanks for the invite. For yeah. yeah, this is much more um, friendly conversation than last time. So, I, what happened I last it. time? Last time we fought over the speaker drama. They they said that <laughs> Democrats are to blame, and we had a contentious. Democrats are to blame for the speaker drama. Well, what? That's not that's not what I said. Democrats had a missed opportunity. How do you like I your new speaker? Uh, yeah, we didn't. We never. How do you like your new speaker? Mike Johnson? Yeah. Well, he's yeah. continued Nancy Pelosi's budget up and through J January now, probably. Oh, okay. So we'll he's see. continuing our budget. So, there so far, go. so good. Yeah. You think we're going to have a government shutdown? No, they just passed a bill while we were talking right. to keep it going in the House. Now it's got to go to the Senate. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. More Democrats. Yeah. Good. Okay. 
All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. I guess since we have more super chats to read, right? You just... We do. Yeah. Okay. We'll say goodbye well, to you guys. Thanks for coming all right. on. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Amazing. Thanks. thanks for having us. Bye -bye. Go cook dinner. Hi, you just listened to a clip from the Sitch and Adams show. If you like what you heard, you can listen to our live show right here on this channel on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you want, you can super chat us. We read $20 and up super chats on the show and then do a follow-up stream on the following Tuesday where we read the rest of the unread super chats and interact with fans of the show. Subscribe to this channel right here to listen to the live show or to listen to more of our awesome clips.